just yeah. okay. So the question of the week from last week um, was: As a Christian, do you have to get rid of everything that has a cult theme, such as the movie Nine or Coraline or the video game Skyrim, or only certain things like Ouija boards? Where is the line that you draw? You know, how what what are the what are the distinctive gray? I should say black and white barriers that you have. This is just, there is no right or wrong answer. This is just what you hold to in your own house by your own beliefs. I think system. it falls underneath your convictions. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some things that are like you don't need in your house, like, for instance, like the uh, demon possession type movies. Um, but, like, so there's sometimes there's like a fine line of the, is this impacting my house? Or is it not impacting my house? Is it more fantasy or is it more on the real side? So where do you draw the line is the question. Um, I, I don't worry about the line because you make the line. <laughs> I, I'm like, Michael, is this good to have? Yeah, okay, we'll keep it. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't worry about it myself. Um, so sorry. let's pretend like I die or something or we get divorced or something. Where is your line? I'm all or nothing a lot of the times, so I would probably just throw everything out. So you'd buy all the demonic movies and throw them all away? <laughs> I'm, I'm really bad about it. I either do everything or don't do everything. So if you died, I'd probably get rid of everything. So you'd probably go to an extreme? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm really bad about going to extremes. Not, not, I'm, I'm not saying that everybody should go to extremes, but I personally am. Because I feel like if I, if I have middle ground... I feel like I relax too much sometimes. Okay. So I feel like I have to go to extremes. Okay, so you feel like you'd be an extremist hypothetically. Yeah. Um, anybody else? What, what like, do you guys... Okay, like my household, it's more of just stuff that deals with demonic possession. Okay. Like movies like Coral Line and Nine are okay in the house, uh -huh. but something like uh, The Conjuring. Okay. Yes, we like the movie, we just don't watch it. Oh, okay. My dad's had too many bad experiences with it. Or just stuff like that. Right. But what confuses me about my house is they still have, you know, Kachina dolls and drink packages. I'm like, it's kind of like a double negative. Yeah. It's just canceling each other out. Well, Grace and I were laughing about that, about how when, when we grow up, you know, there's those things that are just like, oh, no, our parents would never let, let us let us watch or, or use that. But then there are other things that are just like our parents are like, you whatever. You don't think about it. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, what, what were some of the movies that we were talking about the other day, just laughing about it? Um, like, my parents wouldn't let me watch... Um, what was the movie that you guys used to watch all the time? And I was like, oh, I wasn't allowed to watch it. I, I don't like know. That's Power probably Rangers. that's... I wasn't allowed to watch Power Rangers. What? But I was allowed to watch The Mummy. <laughs> it was like... What? Okay. okay. Um, Pokemon. Remember how evil Pokemon oh, was? Oh, so evil. <gasps> so, posing this question also, where do you draw the line on quote-unquote Christian movies and stuff yeah. with these themes in them? Like right. Frank Peretti has books yeah, that have these themes in them. Yeah. Movies yeah. now that have these themes in them. You can't simply you say no demonic activity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. The Bible talks about demonic activity. You're gonna throw yeah, the Bible right. away. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Where is the line? Right. And I think it. I think it has a. I think it depends also like if it's a movie or a game. Is it all about? The um, occult. Is it or glorifying is it, the things? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, is that your line? Yeah. That that's your line, and is that your line too? Yeah, yeah. Is it is it all about the occult where it's concentrating on that, or is it just a side note where good prevails and the occult is just? Well, if side correct note. me if I'm wrong, but in the Exorcist, the demon is actually exercised in the end. Yes. So technically, you could say that that but would it's be all a, about the. Uh, demon the girl demon. being demon possessed. Right. Um. I, it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, okay? But I believe she gets a Ouija board. She starts messing around mm -hmm. with it, and then eventually she makes contact with the spirit. Right. Then eventually the spirit uh, possesses her, mm -hmm. and then throughout the process they're trying different things. They go to a psychiatrist. Uh, they go to different things, and then eventually they go to I think it's a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And then he is able to exercise the demon from her. So technically, you could argue that, that the Exorcist would be a movie about the victory of uh, over mm -hmm. over the demon. So there, where is your line then? <laughs> like there's another one called Exorcismus, but it's more it focuses more on the actual exorcism. Okay. Like that's 99% of the movie is the actual exorcism, but it 
it's still, in my eyes, I still consider it. Okay. So to me, and I, I don't know if this is like old fashioned or not, but um, I feel like exorcisms and stuff like that shouldn't be broadcast. I feel like it, it's more like a a personal thing, maybe. I don't know. It's like, what do you mean by personal thing? Not something that should be all over TV. Okay. So you don't. I mean, so much as somebody left on their own to exercise themselves. Right, no, no, no. no. Okay. But I mean, like, it shouldn't be something like, hey, guys, this person's going to get um, um, exercise. Let's go watch. It's not like a hanging, you know? <laughs> oh, my God. So you're saying that we should watch hangings. Got it. Okay, okay. so where are, where are your guys' lines? Anybody else? Were you going to say anything else about that? Because you brought up things like Frank Brady, for instance. Right. Um... I don't know. I, I think that especially um, when I was younger and stuff, there was there was certain things that had um, demonic or even like New Age or Middle Eastern influences mm -hmm. and stuff in them, and I I I got rid of them. You know, as as I became aware of of what it was, mm -hmm. I, I would get rid of it. Um, it's a very, it's it's hard to really say yeah. there with that because you've got a lot of quote unquote Christian writers yeah. and stuff that are very into spiritual things, right. very, and yeah. and then you have even a, a harder difficult because it's not just people like Frank Peretti, the the writer of uh, Harry Potter. I mentioned this. J.K. Rowling is professes to be a Christian. She's mm -hmm. actually a member of a Christian church, mm -hmm. but yet she wrote a, a, a book that is has a lot of witchcraft in it. So that brings up the question of, you know, where is that line? Yeah. Yeah. You know, is it wrong to read the Harry Potter books or is it not wrong? Is it okay to watch the movies or is it not okay? I think it's just the, it's based on your own experience and your own personal judgment. Now, but there is a danger to that too because some yeah. people excuse using Ouija boards because, oh, it's not going to affect me. Well, right. and... So, Right. That might not be I, the best I think either. that you really need to pray about it. Uh -huh. yeah. Especially yeah. if you have, when you're first watching it, if you feel any kind of yeah. conviction, yeah. you really need to pray about it. Yeah. Because we will deceive yeah. ourselves oh, into yeah. saying it's But it's fine. a really good movie. It's fine. <laughs> you know, exactly. it's, it's yeah. the, look how great the graphics are. Whatever. It's, it's, it's fine. I, it's just a little bit, you know? Right. And then we allow this crap into our lives. Right. You know, it makes me think, you know, back um, the, the theater before movies, you know, that was the movie. So you went to the theater. Right. And in some plays, they would have people actually nude and actually having sex in the theater production. So, boy, what great graphics that had. <laughs> Anybody else want to, want to share? Or anything else. If you want to say something else, you can. Nicole, I see you eyeing your pen. I'm just trying to figure out how to phrase it. Okay. I guess it would just kind of come down to, like Chuck said, you know, if you get a, if you get, if you feel like you shouldn't be watching it, just don't. Like, yeah. One thing I will say, too, is the more that you allow that stuff into your life and make excuses for it, the less the Holy Spirit's going to give you that check. Yeah. yeah. Right. And also, I want to add to that this, that if you are a new Christian, you won't always have that check there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh uh, well, I grew up watching this movie. That doesn't make it okay. <laughs> like, uh, you have to reevaluate your, really? re your whole world, you know? Yeah. I, I think ultimately, if you're questioning and you don't know whether you should have it or not, just do without it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, That's I a good rule more, of thumb, I guess. I that way, be or even, safe than or sorry, even ask you know. somebody who is you know, well known, well known yeah. or, or another more uh, Christian. Uh -huh. Well, see, what I find a lot in, in this community is there's a lot of people who just say they just write off everything. Yeah. Like our community is very consciously scarred i mean the, the conscience of, of this city just doesn't exist yeah. yeah people just kind of do whatever they want whenever they want and then they call themselves christians and they'll completely justify it like it's okay that i watch this that i have this in my house that i it, they're they're totally okay with it like new mexico is one of the most spiritually dead states i've ever been in 
I've been in California. It's a lot of my life I lived in California. Came to Edgewood for a lot of my life, and I was like, wow, this place is very spiritually corrupt. And I went to Texas, and everybody's a Christian there. Or well, at least they profess And the be. thing is, like, in New Mexico, I mean, there's a, just a buttload of churches. Yeah. But it's all just, like, basically going through the motions. Right. Like, like right. everybody goes to church and that, but... There's New Mexico actually reminds me of, if you guys have ever read the books of um, First and Second Kings, it actually reminds me of that, like, where they'll have just these, these kings that are just like, oh, he was pretty good, but he left the altars up in the high places, yeah. and, you know, he didn't get rid of all that stuff. You know, it's just like, well, that's pretty much New, New Mexico. Like, this patch is okay. You know, he's he doesn't really, you know, honestly, preach anything. These Christians don't really do anything. Honestly, now, personally, I don't really watch a lot of movies. Because they've all just got so much in them. That oh no, but seriously. In one way or another, negative. And it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm one of those that just, oh, don't watch TV, don't watch movies, you know. <laughs> Because they yeah. do walk among us. But <laughs> a lot of it I just look at and it's like, is this going to really benefit me yeah. in any way? So I just don't watch them. Well, see, I watch Star Wars. But Star Wars is heavily influenced by New Age thinking yeah. and Hinduism. So, I mean, if you've seen the, the, the new one... Um, uh, Rogue One. Rogue One. Yeah, where he's like, I'm one with the Force, the Force is one with me or whatever. That's basically teaching the oneness of the universe yeah. and yeah. meditation principles, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, it, obviously people have tried to Christianize it by saying stuff like, oh, the, the Holy Spirit. Is... or or And it's like, well, yeah, I, I see yeah. what you're trying to do and I applaud your effort, I guess, to find God in everything. But God isn't in everything. You know what I mean? So you have to really be careful. <laughs> um you know, but then, okay, so so here's my line. My line is, if the theme is the demonic, that's my first rule of thumb, that it's a no. On the movie Nine, it is literally an analogy of Satanism. I can't, in good conscience, justify having that movie in my house knowing that it is an analogy of Satanism. I'm definitely not a Satanist, and I don't agree with Satanism, so I'm not going to have a movie that condones right. Right. Satanism. I'm not going to do that. Right. Um, Coraline um, has – the movie itself isn't necessarily a bad-themed movie, but it's a very dark movie if you've ever seen it. And it has stuff we, like – yeah, and it has stuff like tea leaf reading. It has, you guys watching? I've never heard of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you guys only watch old movies, so <laughs> – <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and and so it has tea leaf readings. It has a lot of uh, occultic kind of themes throughout it. Just stuff like that. Um, Skyrim. I play this video game because the occultic things are very slight in it. Like, let me explain. They have charms in it. Well, you can just not equip them on your character. They have magic. You don't have to use the magic. Yeah. And it's more of a fantasy magic anyways, for more of a perk system than anything. So it's not really the same as real, actual magic rituals. Um, you know, stuff like that. So I, I, Skyrim is kind of borderline for me. There's some things in it that I really... Yeah. You know, like, Gracie knows what I'm talking about. Some of the Daedric princes, like Molag Ball and stuff, where it's like, well, that's that's demonic right there. You know what I mean? Like, And it just crosses that line. So there's a few things you don't have to necessarily give it a, give it up, but maybe stay away from that quest in the game. Right. So I mean, like there's ways around just giving up everything. You can give up everything, and that's totally fine if your conscience takes you that way. But I'm just saying, you can have a good conscience without getting rid of everything. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the idea is kind of the idea of abstaining. But then the second rule of thumb is if if it doesn't sit well in my spirit, like like what Chuck was saying. I read this present darkness and piercing the darkness, even though they have, it has demonic themes in it. It has um, uh, spirit guides in it and meditational chants and that kind of stuff. It has New Age themes. All, it has a lot of those kinds of things. But it does it from the perspective of Christ being glorified. And the whole idea is, that, is this, that there is a war all around us. Now, obviously, the details are not fact. It's, it's laced with fiction. It's fiction. You know, uh, but... Still, there is a spiritual side to, to the world, and there is a battle going on right now for our very souls. Uh -huh. And we know that our prayers do matter. Well, in the book, he shows us the prayers mattering. And in the book, he shows Christ's victory over the demonic. So although it's not necessarily a theology textbook, you know, it, its theme is glorifying God. I don't watch The Exorcist because its theme is, is on f making you fear 
or making you pay too much attention to the demonic. It's not focused on glorifying God. Right. Even though the demon is exercised in the end. See what I mean? Like, th there's more important things to the story than just the ending. It's, you know, how how did they get there? What were the themes? I, I think another thing, um, this is something that I do personally, uh, because I lead the youth in that, and they're they're always watching things that they shouldn't be watching. And, you know. So I make myself aware of, you know, they'll bring up something or that, yeah. and I'll go and I'll research it research it to find out what it is, because I don't want to be one of those people that's just like, oh, no, that's bad. It's evil. Stop watching. Fidget spinners are evil. You know, so <laughs> right. you, you need to be aware of, of the stuff, but there yeah. again... The, there's a difference in awareness and acceptance of and, it. And see, that's where, I guess, where it takes us to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to be an active influence in your decisions. Okay, and so, but what that means is you can't let your feelings take charge while still listening to the Holy Spirit. It's a very hard, if you're not used to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, it seems like you're just following your emotions. And on, on a lot of part, we do that. Well, you just don't want me to watch that movie. I'm not going to give that up because I don't see anything wrong with it. You know, because we're not listening to the Holy Spirit. We were listening to our emotions, and our emotions tell us there's nothing wrong with this. <laughs> See what I mean? So there's 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 just hard areas about this. Now I wanted to show you guys some things that I found shared on Facebook this past week that I really think uh, are are exactly what we've been talking about. This one here: uh, when you naturally have a healing aura, you attract a lot of damaged people, and having them in your life could drain your energy to the max. A reminder that it's not your job to heal everyone that enters your life. Okay. There's a few things wrong with this, so we're going to look at it step by step. The first thing is a healing aura. First off, there's no scientific proof that auras actually exist. I think what you mean is some people are maybe more upbeat people. That has nothing to do with your aura. That just has to do with your personality. Some people are just more upbeat. And yes, upbeat people do attract attract other people because they do want to be upbeat too. Um, and not, not so much attract in the sense that there's spiritual forces tugging them. I mean, we just like being around people that make us feel better about ourselves. And happy people tend to make us feel better about ourselves. There's nothing mystical about that, but this is said in a mystical way. And having them in your life could drain your energy to the max. I think what you mean is it can make you feel tired. And, of course, there are draining people in the world, but people don't pull on your life force. You know what I mean? They make you feel tired. Like, for instance, I am a um, – what's it called when you don't like to be around people? Introvert. Introvert. When I'm around too many people for too long, I feel tired. Yeah. That doesn't mean my life energy has been drained. That just means I need a break to go break to go to sleep and relax and be alone for a little bit. Yeah. So you know, then then there's that. And remember, we have the Holy Spirit helping us, and the Holy Spirit we have to trust is guiding us to people that we can have an impact on and whatnot. Of course, there's always that temptation, always that temptation, that we stop taking care of our spiritual lives. And pour too much into people instead of letting God pour into us, right. obviously. And we get more more spiritually drained that way, obviously. Um, a reminder that it's not your job to heal everyone. Well, that's 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 we. It's not our job to heal anyone who enters our life. Right. It's our job to follow God and let God heal them. Right. And sometimes God uses us. Yeah. Okay. There. So there's just a lot of things wrong with this. It's on the surface. It sounds real good. And you know the thing is, a Christian shared this. It's steeped in the New Age, and yet a Christian shared it. Here's another one here. Now, notice the picture first off. Do you see the dualistic kind of nature of the picture, how there's yeah. these two life forces that are at war? You attract into your life a reflection of what you think. Basically, what you think makes what is real. But you also attract into your life what you judge. If you think people are dishonest, you attract dishonest people. If you are focused on sickness or disease, you attract more of the sickness or the disease. If you focus on poverty or lack, you gain nothing more than an empty bank account. Everything you hold in your conscious thought becomes your cage and your reality. See abundance, uh, see honesty, and all embrace good. First off, this denies that there is evil in the world. It focuses on what you think is there. And if you think it is there, then it will be there. But that's not true. See what I mean? Job, by all means, was a good person, but yet disaster struck him. Yeah. He lost his wealth. He he lost his family. He lost his health. Well, was he focusing on bad things? No, not at all. He was focusing on, on honoring God. In fact, that's one of his complaints. He's like, God, I don't even understand what's going on here. I wasn't doing anything bad. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so then there's that. Second off, we don't 
life isn't full of karma, which karma is the idea, of, or yin yang also, the idea of, of opposing forces and what you do, it, you know, will carry over into the next life. Um, you know, there's this constant pull of good and bad, and, and every, every good has a bit of bad, and every bad has a bit of good. But that's not true. So you attract you, what you judge, like what? <laughs> no, just just no. Uh, if you are focused on a sickness or disease, you attract more. No, not at all. This is uh, Christian science teaches this too. That it's 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 not really real. And if you just ignore its existence, somehow you'll be able to overcome it. This is denying reality. The reality is what it is. You don't have to like it or not like it, but it still is what it is. And God is the only thing that brings healing to it. Okay? The reason why sickness exists is not because we focus on it or we think about it. It's because we sinned in the Garden of Eden. So now we are corrupted. And so now we are waiting for the day of our salvation. That's how it is. Not because we're thinking about certain things. And there's no money in the bank account, not because your focus is on no money in the bank account, but because you're spending too much money and you're not making enough money. So stop spending so much money and start earning more money. Or in other words, get a job, you hippie, <laughs> and stop spending things. <laughs> get rid of your credit card. Problem solved. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> that has nothing to do with what you focus on. But yet, once again, these are things that a Christian posted. Another thing that I see Christians posting a lot on Facebook... A lot. If you share this, what the crap? You know, I'll just close it from here. If you share this, you know, God's going to bless you. Yeah. I actually shared this funny thing on Facebook that said, um, uh, I, my creditors called me today, but but I told them, you know, I typed amen on a post the other day, and so in, in a couple of days, I'm going to get a ton of money, and I'll pay you back then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or here's another one. Uh, Peter's all at the gate, you know, of heaven with his book, and he says, "Oh no, you didn't, you didn't share that post on Facebook. You can't get in." <laughs> but anyways, so going back to this, um, so we're looking at Satanism. Now, Satanism is a lot different than a lot of us think. It, you know, when you think about it, Satanism, you know, everybody's wearing these creepy robes, right? And they meet in in these dark basements. And, you know, they have pentagrams drawn on the floor, and then they have an animal sacrifice in the middle, or a person. You know, and, and there is truth to that, but it's not necessarily what you're thinking, okay? So here's the main problem, is that there's actually two different forms of Satanism. The first is called traditional. Now, this is the one everybody thinks of when they think about actual Satan worship, okay? Um, they have, you know, they do have human or, or an, and animal sacrifices. They do um, think that Satan is a literal person. And they do literally worship him, okay? But then there's this whole other group of Satanists, which are called modern Satanists, which is not something I even knew existed. Basically, Satan is an impersonal object. Satan is not a real being so much as a concept or a power that's in the, in the world, okay? And so they're not actually going to worship him per se. They're going to do more like worship self. They're going to do more like whatever they want. Because the law is something that Christians made up to keep people under fear. Wow. See what I mean? It's going to be more focused on just living your life as, as fully as possible. So here's the thing. They don't actually claim to worship Satan, okay? But by living that way, they are worshiping Satan. Which brings me to my next point that I'm going to say. There's a spectrum of Satanism. On this far end is traditional Satanism. They worship literally Satan. But then there's the next step down from that modern Satanism where they don't literally worship Satan. Okay. Then there's a step down from that where they worship idols generally. But then there's a step lower than that where they just don't ser seek, serve God. Then there's a step past that where, where they're relatively good people. But then there's a step past that where they're pretty good people. But then there's a step past that to where you're actually a Christian. So the Christian is the exact opposite spectrum of the traditional Satanist. Because traditional Satanist worships Satan. A Christian worships God. Traditional Satan, Satanists follows these different rituals and, and whatnot, whereas Christians, we deny those kinds of rituals. Instead, we focus on, on prayer and on reading his word and that kind of stuff, okay? Which can be described by occultists as rituals. I understand that. So there's these two main things, but here's the thing. They all have different ideas of Satan anyways. Um, so it, if you meet a Satanist, you don't really know what they believe for sure. They could believe that, but, you know... There's this kind of – and one of the big problems is there's really no authority in Satanism. 
this is the is the Satanist Bible. Well, there is a Satanist Bible, but that doesn't mean that just because you're Satanist, you believe the Satanist Bible. See what I mean? Like there's there's different Satanists, so they, they don't all believe the same thing, and there is no rule of thumb with it. So keep that in mind. So Satan can be either the real God. In other words, God, as we know him, doesn't exist. It, we, he, we, the church made him up to, to draw people away from the real God, who is actually Satan. And Satan isn't you know a bad person or a bad being or anything. He's just told people. The church has just told you that he's this bad guy to get you to follow them because they wanted to be in power. Okay, Or Satan can be one among other gods. So there are other gods that exist. We just worship Satan instead. Okay, Then um, Satan can be an equal power with God. Like here's Yahweh and here's Satan. They're equal forces. Two gods. Two separate gods. Okay. Um, some people combine different variations of this. God is mostly, you know, the good God, but he has a little bit of evil in him. And then Satan is the mostly evil God, but he has a little bit of good in him. You know, like the yin yang. Um, some people go to the extreme, to the other extreme. God is all good. Satan is all evil. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so just a lot of different views there. Um, then uh, other people like Anton LaVey, for instance, taught that Satan is an evil which is in everything. Um it exists everywhere. It is a force that you have to tap into to get more out of life, basically, to, to enjoy your life more, basically. So Satan is not an actual being, and you don't have to worry about sin because the idea of sin is just kind of like, you know what I mean? It's not really a thing. It's more of a thing that the Christian church made up. And uh, Satanists don't necessarily believe in a next life. Some may technically believe in a next life, but a lot of Satanists believe that life ends at death. And so it literally doesn't matter. So there's a lot of different – see what I mean? A lot of this I didn't know. Wow. Like I thought Satanists just had their own little like Satanist heaven or whatever. Right. <laughs> but, you know, and some of them do believe in a form of a next life. Um, some of them believe in reincarnation. You know, But there is no rule of thumb on this. And a lot of Satanists um, – I believe mostly modern Satanists believe that there is no next life at all. So um, – so the church is the enemy. They are basically, um, you know, they just need to be purged from the world because they are a fungus on the world. They've caused so many of the problems. They've caused, you know, all the all the all the all the things that are going on. They've caused government. A lot of Satanists are actually anarchists. They don't believe that there should be a governing force that people should just be able to do whatever they want whenever they want, which obviously opens up the idea. So you can molest children? Yes, of course you can. Now, not all Satanists are going to go to that extreme. Some of them are going to kind of like keep themselves in, in check, you know what I mean? But a true Satanist will say, no, there is no law that holds me because I am above it. Um, Anton LaVey, for instance, taught the idea of the law of Thelema, the law of the will. Whatever you want to do is, is fine. Um, so anyways, um, so the church is just this evil thing. Um, we have you know hidden truth from people for ages upon ages. And we've turned, you know, Satan into an actual being and made him evil, and we've made up our own God to make ourselves happier about stuff, so we could, so we could impress, impress our will over other people, um, so that we could, you know, be in control of things. And the idea of Satanism really is very old. In the Bible, it talks about Molech. Now, Molech, it seems, is a form of ancient Satanism. We don't know for sure, but it seems like it. Okay, it's got where their children were sacrificed on, on to fire on fire to their god. Molech, um, which is kind of seems like a Satanist idea. Then a lot of the things that they did in, in service to Molech is very similar to uh, to Satanism or traditional Satanism, um, not modern Satanism, but traditional Satanism. So there is that that it could potentially have existed for a long time. The first recorded e example of for sure Satan trying to get people to specifically worship him is where Satan is talking to Jesus in his ministry. And he says, if you'll worship me, I'll do this. And he mm -hmm. leads him to the temptations. That's the, that's the first, for sure, recorded instance of an attempted Satanism. Okay? So the Satan, the traditional Satanism, I mean, it existed in the medieval ages. You know, they, they had the witch trials and stuff like that. They, I mean, it's been all throughout history after that, but we don't really know for sure um, how long Satanism has, has existed. Um, however, it should be noted that, that the different uh, occultic practices of the other nations that God was so saw so abominable or detestable that we looked at last week, remember that? Yeah. That those are all have their root in, demo in, the, in, the, in the demonic. 
So technically, and most broadly, you could say that that was a, was a form of Satanism. But you have to see it as a different thing. You have to see Satanism as kind of like an off branch of it. So, um, so obviously, there's direct versus indirect, indirect worship of Satan. I've, I've mentioned that. You know, direct would be traditional Satanism, where they actually worship the person of Satan. Indirect would be where they do things that glorify Satan, like living however you want, but don't actually claim that he's a person. Um, so Satanism has, you know, a, a bunch of different different symbols here. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of this because as I was working on, it, I just really felt a check in my spirit not to explain too much of things and not to study too much of things. And so I listened to that check, and I didn't. Um, a pentagram, it's been around for, for a long time, but all you really need to know is there's a lot of secret meanings with the different points, and it's been associated with the cult for a long time. Um, as far as I can tell, the pentagram was used in other occultic things besides Satanism. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, the Baphomet, this is the thing that everybody knows, the goat on the throne, right? Everybody knows about that. Um, and it seems like that comes from where Jesus is talking about shepherding the sheep from the goats. And he puts the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand. And the goats are the ones that, that he says, get out, you know, leave my prisons. You know, I, I never knew you. Um, and so they, a lot of them will talk about the, the two ways. There will be equal ways, but opposites. So there's the right way, the left, the left way, the 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 way of the sheep, the way of the goat, and they would claim that they follow the way of the goat. Um, the goat is very very prominent in Satanism. Um, I think it was uh, Aleister Crowley had a, 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 a magazine or something like that. It was called the Cloven Hoof, uh, which of course is referring to a goat. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, about the fist, a lot of people ask about this. This is a sign of Satanism. It's a well-accepted sign for Satanism. This is a sign of love from from uh, I think it's American Sign Language or maybe English Sign Language. I forget which one. It's English. English. Okay, okay. ESL. Maybe. And then this is the rock fist. Okay, there's a big difference. People think that this is the rock fist. This is not the rock fist. This is Satanism. This is the rock fist. But doesn't it depend on how you put your fingers? Does so you have to do like this for Satan? No. Uh, then the, the, the college thing, that's this. Lobos is this. Lobos is that? Okay. Well, see, they ha that's how they distinguish themselves from Satanists. But that is Satanism. Yeah. That one. Okay. So just so we're, we're all clear on that, because a lot of people, you know, oh, don't do that. That one's evil. And it's like, what are you talking about, you <laughs> crackheads? <laughs> um, anyways, um, it's a well-accepted sign of Satanism. Uh, really, it's not, as far as I know, it's not really contested. A lot of people will say it's not really but, I mean, they don't really know what they're talking about, obviously, so no proof that I could find of anything that contradicts that. Um, <clears throat> the Satanism relies a lot on uh, occultic practices, so the same things that, you know, witches will do and that kind of stuff, Satanists will do, because it's all just kind of one, one big conglomeration, do whatever you want. And like uh, Anton LaVey said, you know, it's this, this just this power that's out there that, that you can harness for your well-being. So why not? In fact, he was talking about um, if you're gonna create a god in, in your image, why not just create yourself as god? You know, and and so just that I think that really encaptures you know his idea of just uh, better contempt, I guess you would say, for for God. Um, okay, um, secret knowledge. Satanism depends a lot on secret knowledge, just like the Gnostics before them, just like you know the the witches, just like all these other things. They all all. Obviously, occultists, they all rely on that secret knowledge. Um, magic, uh, there is a distinction in the word magic. Um, Aleister Crowley reinvented the idea of magic uh, to separate it from stage illusions that magicians do. So if you see it spelled with a K at the end, that is thanks to Aleister Crowley. I believe, oh no, that might, that might have been somebody else. Oh, I might have mixed him up with somebody else. Oh no, I think it was Aleister Crowley. Oh man, I didn't write that down. There's a lot of people in Satanism. And you kind of get confused after a little while. Um, oh, wow. Ooh, don't hold me to that, guys. I believe it was Aleister Crowley. Ooh. Okay. Um, I'll look it up. Um, Satanism relies a lot on rituals. Um, a lot on rituals. They have, you know, secret secret rituals and stuff like that, which is another thing that, that scares me off of Freemasons because the whole ritual thing really creeps me out. 
The only rituals that God's people have ever been required to fulfill was Judaism back in the book of Leviticus, but that was done away with with Jesus, so there should be no rituals that we have to take a part of. Um, some would argue that you know water baptism is a ritual, but not really because a ritual has um, secret power that it conveys. Water baptism doesn't give us secret power. It's something that we do after we're saved. Our salvation is not dependent on water, on water baptism. Just because you're saved, if you don't get water baptized after you're saved, doesn't mean you lose your salvation. Okay. For instance, Jesus was hanging on the cross, and he said, Today I'm going to see you in paradise, but that man never got a chance to be water baptized. Well, if water baptism is dependent on our salvation, that dude didn't really go to paradise, which means Satan was, and Jesus was either lying, or he just didn't know what he was talking about, which I refuse to believe that, and, or else he's not really God. So, um, uh, Sometimes they'll worship with Satan, I've mentioned that, so... Um. So magic, it's CK. Right. Um, and it is LSD. Okay, yeah. What were you going to say, Dana? Um, the, some religions will use some of this stuff that are yeah. like, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if you follow the Bible, how can you do the rituals? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, we're, we're going to look at a man named Aleister Crowley, which was really foundational for modern witchcraft and modern Satanism, too. Um, and he he's going to follow something very similar to what you just said. Hold on. Um, Satanism, Satanism is also real dependent on defilement of, of, of holy things. Okay, they, they 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 love that, and a lot of the rituals just anything to defile things. They'll, they'll take a cross, for instance, and, and hang it upside down. They'll uh, have a mass, which they call black mass, which they'll chant things from a Catholic mass but backwards. You know, and I have that written down on a site here in the future. Um, and they'll have sacrifices that they have at the time. You know, what I mean, just just defiling something. So if something is considered sacred or pure or holy, like a church, then they would do something specifically against that. Like, um, I believe it was a Mexican church I was at. I want to say it was in Mexico. Yeah, I think it was in Mexico, where um, this the 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 demon worshippers in, in the village really didn't like that this pastor was here and so they uh, if I remember correctly they uh, they did a, a chicken sacrifice and put they put it on the on the doorstep of the church as a way of defiling it and so that's really big in Satanism defiling the sacred things because once again they hate Christianity because they believe that Christianity is this thing that that is invented to keep people in fear. I mean, honestly, can you really blame them for that, though? I mean, look at the history of the Catholic Church, you know, and then when you look at the Reformation, some people really, like, they really, oh, the Reformation was such a great time. The Reformation was a time of the church losing its unity, it was a time of mass slaughter in the church, mass slaughter. Christians were, I mean, Catholics were killing Protestants, Protestants were killing Catholics. Did, did something good come of it? Yes, absolutely something good came of it. But at what price? Yeah. See, I mean, like, a lot of people... Died and it's just mass bloodshed. Uh, the Crusades did something good come of the Crusades in a way, I guess you could say, but not really. Is Islamic people are still scared of Christians because of what was done back then. Christians still have a bad name because of what was done back then. So I mean, that was a thousand years ago, and it still has a bad idea with, with Christianity. Yeah, Westboro Baptist really isn't doing anybody favors. Right. I think even Satan at this point is like, okay, just sh stop talking. I, I <laughs> like, actually heard, um, uh -huh. what's her name? Uh, Reese Witherspoon is going to be putting out a movie um, portraying the daughter to the Westboro guy who was, I guess, like heir to the throne uh -huh. you know, and rejected all of that. Yeah. Remember when we guys were looking at Westboro Baptist? Remember that? Yeah. Huh. Um, so defilement of God uh, of, the, of sacred things or something that they think is sacred things, either or, um, and and reversals. You know, they'll do a lot of things like messages played backwards and stuff, uh, things written backwards. You know, the, the cross upside down, a, a reversal of things. And the idea of that, as far as I can understand, is because they're the opposite of the right way. They're the left way. They're the goats, not the lambs. So everything's reversed, as far as I can tell. Um, it's hard to really find a for sure thing on that, but that's what it seems like. Now, this was kind of taken to the extremes, though, by a lot of um, Christian groups who tried to find hidden things in everything. Uh, Michael W. Smith had an album where some of his lyrics um, on the back of it were printed backwards um, just for the song title. It, it was just an artistic thing. I mean, it, 
really was anything bad. But of course, you know, the, you know that means they used the Satanist. And then some of the songs, like, uh, they were playing them backwards. And, I mean, I guess you could somehow think that it might be saying that, like, if you really twisted the sound of it. But you have to play it backwards, and then you have to, like, say that word kind of sounds like this word. It's not clear. Satanism usually is a little more clear than that. Like, they'll do secret hidden things and stuff, but usually they won't live a whole Christian life, glorify God with their ministry, have multiple uh, worship services that they record, and then sell, like, two people so that they can worship too. Normally, the Satanists won't do that and go that far for the, for their points. Usually, they'll just, like, haha, you thought I was a Christian. Like, Avenged Sevenfold, I think it was, who, uh, you know, pretended to be, you know, a Christian or whatever. And then after some time, they came out and said, you know, no, we're just, we just have a lot of Christian themes to attract Christians to our music. Um, we're Satanists. You know, that is a good example of a Satanist band. They pretend for a little while, but they don't stick it through that long. Yeah. Like, yeah. just no. <laughs> and you can tell when Michael W. Smith is leading worship that it's heartfelt. Like, you know, and so then, there, then there's the idea of, well, what about his background? He's never been associated with these kinds of things, so why attribute it to it? Um, so, Tools of Satanism. <clears throat> why is it doing this? This is the second time it's done this. <laughs> It messed up my, my my slide. Why did it do that? Anyways, Black Mass, I talked about this. It's basically, basically a parody of the Catholic Mass. You know, they do things backwards. They have sacrifices. Sexual immorality is real do predominant in, in, in Satanism, um, really, because they don't... It's really the opposite of Christianity. In Christianity, we believe that there's only one correct way of sexual contact. One man and one woman being married. Yeah. It's the only way that Christianity teaches is, is morally acceptable for people right. to have a sexual relationship. Right. Satanism says, nah, forget about that. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. Homosexuality, sex with kids, I mean, it doesn't matter. In fact, if you ever heard the heard the association uh, NAMBLA, it's basically their goal in life is to have sex with children. Uh, creepy, creepy organization. Anyways, getting off track. Um, uh, you know, sexual immorality, they, they'll believe, like... You can have sex with relatives, with kids, with animals, with animals. I mean, really, it's whatever. Do whatever thou wilt. Literally, whatever thou wilt. Um, a very predominant, which is why I'm so confused why you're seeing Christians start going to the side of, of not taking a stand for sexual purity. Yeah. You know, oh, it's okay to sleep with somebody before marriage. What? It's what? What? Oh, pornography isn't that big of a deal. Wait, what? What? <laughs> like, wh What? Yeah, you can be a pastor and be a homosexual. What? Like, what are we talking about here? Now, it's okay to be a Christian and struggle with something, like to be tempted with something. Even Jesus was tempted. As long as that temptation doesn't take fruit. Okay? To look at a woman and say, wow, that, that woman's very attractive is different as to saying, wow, that woman's really attractive. See what I mean? Yeah. Like, if, noticing someone is attractive is okay, but let it lie there and move on. Right. See what I mean? But when you start thinking about how attractive they are, and then lusting, and then the next thing after that, until eventually, um, lust gives birth to, to, to rape, it gives birth to abuse. Um, a lot of people who are uh, child abusers or child molesters started out as just being in pornography, because it escalates. Okay, it escalates. Um, which I believe uh, Anton LaVey, if I cr remember correctly, was actually... Uh, uh, accused of having relations with his son, I think. Not positive about that, but I want to say, don't quote me on that. Don't quote me on that. Anyways, um, okay. Uh, they they'll use the the tools of the cult like we talked about last week and the week before, like astrology and Ouija boards and stuff. Because why not? Um, things said backwards. I already said this. Uh, human sacrifice. Um. Sometimes people think, well, not here in America. I'd be surprised, though. Obviously, animal sacrifices are a little bit more common and more well known, but yeah, more, human sacrifice too. More in the backwoods, small towns. Not necessarily, no. One of our kids were watching a movie was going backwards on iPad. Remember, huh. What the heck? Why? It was just. It was just. Taped like that. It was going backwards. Hmm. Uh, okay. I've never seen it online. It might not be anything bad. They might have just been fooling around with the with the VCR. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. just because something's backwards doesn't mean it's evil. Okay. Right. Really, yeah, I don't know. So, uh, 
Uh, that's all I was going to say there. Okay. Man, I really hate how it jumbled up my slides. I hope they're all there. Well, I'm going to be really upset if it deleted some slides. Um, should I try closing it down and reopening it? You can. Well, maybe it just got confused I'm along the way. It on and again. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't ask to ask me if I wanted to save any changes. That's not a good sign. Uh -oh. Oh. Uh -huh. Boy, I sure hope that I sure hope it didn't delete any of the slide, guys, because I really worked hard on this. <laughs> really hard. Like this isn't like a like you know, some of the some of the cults that we talked about. I kind of just did a half done job because we already talked about the things that they believed, and I was like, you know, just know that it's there, you know. Right. But this isn't one of those situations. This is something that I really did a lot of research on this. Right. But I lost my my pen because I didn't write it down on, on notes. I wrote it down in my head. And then I made slides out of that and, and out of my resources oh. and stuff. And, and, guys, if it's not there, it's gone. Oh. Like, that's not good. <clears throat> oh, I know what happened. I was using it as a, um, you know, I copied one of the old slides. And I was pasting it and then just re changing the words on it. And one of them, I must have just accidentally double pasted it. I bet you that's what happened. Oh, thank God. Okay, so let's talk about the limits of Satan because it's it's good to know you know what he can and cannot do. Because here's the thing: if if you think that the demonic can do something, then they're going to convince you that they can't do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're convinced that you as a Christian can be demonically possessed, then they're going to do everything they can to scare the crap out of you. Right. Because you believe that that can happen, and even though it can't. They're okay with that. Like, let's just let's just try and convince this person that they are demon possessed, because they'll do anything to get to get to get their their will in the situation. Um, so, uh, Satan is a fallen angel. Okay, he is an angel that was created as a good being. Okay, that's the first thing to note. God did not create an evil being. God created what would you know become the Satan that we know of as Satan, and he fell. Okay, he rebelled against God, and when he did, he became what we know as Satan. Now, he had angels who joined him in this rebellion. Okay, These excuse me, are the demons. Now, as far as structure, we don't know what kind of a structure exists in the demonic realm. There exists some form of structure, but for instance, do demons always follow, the, follow what Satan tells them to do? We don't know, because it doesn't really make sense that Satan's organization would be very, you know... Organizing. Or yeah, like to to the letter, like they follow everything and sign it and date and it. That doesn't really make much sense because that's not really the way that Satan works in the world. Why would he work like that? In the, but here's the thing: we know there has to be some kind of continuity in in the demonic world because God and Jesus talks about well, if Satan fights against Satan, his kingdom will fall apart. So there is some form, but we don't know to what extent. Um, he's not equal with Jesus. Jesus is God. Satan is an angel. So there's a difference. Um, he was created innocent and good. God did not create a wicked being. Now, he was the one in the Garden of Eden who either spoke through the snake or is called a snake. It could go either way. Um, to Eve, to get her to eat, eat, to eat, the, eat the fruit. Some people say, well, he's just call, being called a snake, but he actually wasn't really a snake. But then that brings up the question, so what does it mean about walk, crawl, you know, you're going to have to crawl on the ground for the rest of your life? Or, you know, snakes are going to have to crawl, crawl on their bellies now. Well, there's a few things that have been, have been suggested. Snakes used to have feet, and the feet were taken away, so now they crawl. That's an idea. Um, that Satan, it was more of a metaphorical thing, equating Satan li like a snake who has to crawl on his belly. Metaphorical? Okay. So there's a lot of different ideas there, um, and I really am one of those people who think that Satan spoke through a snake. Snake? Just like God spoke through a donkey. But here's a problem with that view, though. Why would an animal have to suffer for Satan speaking through it? Yeah. So that brings me to another theory that it's a combination of both. Satan was speaking through an actual snake, and God spoke to the snake and cursed it as the instrument that he used. But also... It was a metaphorical condemnation of Satan as well. I want to say it might be a metaphor because, I mean, when God spoke for the donkey, it doesn't mean God is a donkey. Right. You know what I mean? Right. 
Yes, yes, I do know what you mean, <laughs> and I, I see what you're saying. Um, I, I, I didn't mean to say that. Okay, how to say that? I mean, just it, it was just it was like maybe at like right timing. Eve was there and Snake was there, so Satan used the. Right, and then there's also another another theory out there that Satan appeared in the form of a snake, which. I'm pretty so sure Satan can do that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he can do that. Yeah. Let me check my... Yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. If he can appear as your dead grandma. If he can appear as your dead grandma. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, right. Oh my goodness, I missed something. I hope that wasn't important. Oh, it's just you saying okay. Okay, good. <laughs> um, he probably rebelled to be like God. Okay, he didn't rebel to be God, but to be like God. So what does that mean? Well, yeah, I guess that means he wanted glory? That he wanted... He wanted, wanted glory glory. Be equal. And see, that's what I'm saying. It, it, right. Is it saying that he was trying to become God or equal to God, or is he just saying that he wanted to receive some of the glory like God? Or both. Or See what I mean? Yeah. It just says that he wanted to be like God, but we don't know to what extent. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, we can assume obviously that even before he was, a, 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 you know, fallen, that he couldn't tell the future because he probably wouldn't just condemned himself <laughs> to eternity in yeah. torment. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, do angels um, still fall to this day, or was it just like a one? There is no proof that angels still currently rebel. Mm -hmm. However, there is no definitive statement that says no they do not that's along with that does god still creating angels nowadays or did he stop creating them at some point in the past and he never creates anymore i don't know would that be crazy really clarified. If just like five angels that follow Satan? no 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 it, it definitely <laughs> clarifies that there's thousands of angels that have fallen oh really yeah it, it does clarify that so um it says a, i believe it says a third of 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 all the it's either a third or a fourth of, of all the angels that were in heaven rebelled in Revelations? Yeah, am, I not the, am I the person who has read Revelations here? Uh, yeah. yeah, hey, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. I've never read it all the where, where Satan and Michael are, go to war, war and right. then he's thrown yeah. out of heaven and it says a, a, third, of, a third of the uh, of the angels fell. Yeah. I mean, come on, guys. Read your yeah. Bibles. Yeah, I, I, I never think of, like, okay, the Satan, okay, he, he's a fallen angel, but where all the little guys came from. Right. right. And I mean. then here's another thing is... Yeah. Demons can't be in two places at one per one time, uh -huh. but there are hundreds of people in the world today demon possessed. Well, and here's another question to pose. Satan was a angel, mm -hmm. and all these other demons were angels. Aren't they equal to Satan? Like. Why do they follow Why him? Why do they follow him? I don't know. There's another good question. Like that's why I'm saying there has to be some form of Continuity, yeah, some hierarchy. form of hierarchy, but to what extent we don't know. Yeah. You know, or else there's gonna be chaos. Yeah, you know, you know, and and the Bible always talks about them working together on things. Yeah. You know, so it's like, oh, what's well, the what's the level? Of it? Anyways, Lucifer means morning star, which has yeah. caused some people to think that um it should be translated as morning star instead of Lucifer, but the context clearly describes that God's not talking about a star. He's talking about Satan in that passage. It's in Ezekiel. Um, but here's the thing. Satan is also called terms that Jesus himself is called. Satan is called the morning star. Jesus is also called the morning star. Satan is called a lion. Jesus is also called a lion. Now, here's what I, why I'm bringing this out. Because I don't want you guys to be reading the Bible and say, Satan is Jesus! You know, I'm bringing this up now so that you don't have to deal with that later. The Bible is using ideas to say about something. Lucifer is not literally a star. He is comparing the the uh, God is comparing Lucifer with the morning star in the way that he was, you know, he was the first thing you see in the morning, right? The morning star. He was he was he, he, the morning star is the first, you know, right before the sun rises. It's the morning star, you know, and so it's a way of talking about you know the glory that he was given. Before he fell, but Jesus is considered is is called a morning star in the sense of the, he is the morning star in the sense of not the you know that but the idea of 
He is our salvation. He is the glorified one. He is our way to salvation. He's the morning star. See what I mean? Um, and obviously you can read the context and you'll see the way that it's, it's using the same analogy to emphasize different things. Okay? For instance, they're both called a lion in the sense that Satan is hungry looking for who he can devour, like a lion. Jesus is like a lion in that he's powerful and he's fighting against our enemies, right? He's, he, he, he's called the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's their protector. He's their, you see what I mean? It, it, there's a, a big difference there. So though they're both compared to the same idea, a lion, right. in different ways. Different things about that lion. Yeah. The destructive nature versus the protective nature. Yeah. See what I mean? So same, using the same thing, same analogy for different things, okay? Yeah. So uh, he is not the most beautiful of God's creation. Somewhere along there, people have gotten in there that he was the most beautiful or something. It just says that he was beautiful. That's all it says. Okay? It doesn't say he was most beautiful. There is We as Americans, I think, always have to apply most to everything. <laughs> um, he cannot read minds. He has limited knowledge and power. He can't do whatever he wants whenever he wants. I'm pretty sure you, you asked God, he would say, they don't say something about as people were his most beautiful creatures. <laughs> yeah. But... That's just my guess. <laughs> um, he is limited by time and space. He cannot be everywhere at the same time. He cannot go forward and backwards in time. God is not held to time. He created time and exists outside of time. Satan does not have that privilege. No. We don't know how that works. Did when, when in time or out of time was Satan made? We don't know. Um, we know that he exists now in time and he cannot escape time and that he is forever bound to time. That's what we know now. Uh, he has power to work, work miracles. Yes, you heard me right. He has power to work miracles. Not only at the time of the end, as Revelations talks about, but before that, too. When Moses is going against Pharaoh's witches, for instance, they were able to repeat many of the miracles. Which, how unhelpful is that? God brings a curse, and so your witch, or whatever you want to call them, sorcerer or whatever, they repeat the curse that was just brought on you. Well, thanks, friends. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, here's you some bloody water. Here, can you make me more blood water? Because evidently there's not enough blood water out there in the Nile <laughs> and in here in my house. Hey, why don't you go dig a well, draw water from that well, and turn it into blood too, so I really can't have anything to drink. Be a friend, be a pal. So, I mean, like, yeah. so obviously it can work miracles, but it is still lesser. Okay, He can transform matter. Okay, He made a stick into a snake. He can transform matter from one thing into another thing. How... I don't know. That's a good question. But he can. Um, he can influence nations. In fact, in your, if you read in Job, it talks about how uh, you know this tribe of people was uh, went and attacked. You know, Satan inspired them. He influenced them to go and attack Job's, you know, Job's crops and whatnot. Um, he can reveal things from a far, from far away. For instance, with Jesus, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Instantaneously, he showed him the entire world and all the kingdoms that existed in one moment of time. So he can do that. So a psychic can see what's going on to your family on the other side of the U.S. Because a demonic can do that. Um, he can affect people's lives in the ways of finances. He can bring financial ruin. As with Job, for instance, uh, he can bring health uh, health problems. He can bring political problems. Uh, he can bring uh, you know world events, influence them. He can influence relationships. Obviously, it's all subjected to God. In, in other words... He never can make a choice that is above God, you know, obviously, but he can't still make those decisions, or he can still act, I should say. Um, he does have supernatural power. He can control physical elements, and he can bring storms and those kinds of things um, to a limit, obviously, in all these things. He can afflict people with diseases. He can communicate with the human spirit. This is different than whispering something into your ear. Whispering something into your ear is where you hear something audible, Okay. Communicating with the human spirit is something that you don't foresee happening. It's just something that – it's like this. There is a part of us that somehow dwells in an interdimensional state. I'm, not, I'm trying to say this in, in clearer terms, but I, I'm finding I'm seeing them in, in more confusing terms. And Satan exists in this other dimension, and there's some part of that that he's able to communicate with our spirit without touching our mind – and go straight for our innermost being. How is that possible? I don't really know. Huh. But somehow in that process, he's able to encourage us to do certain things like commit suicide. Or, you know, um, have self-destructive thoughts or those kinds of things. 
how, we don't really know. But he is able to do these things. Um, um, I had a friend that uh, she would wake up in the middle of the night and she would say that Satan told her to jump out the window, which would be like six floor up or whatever. Is that what you're talking about? Or she'll be choked? That's more of an audible thing. Like Satan actually literally spoke to her. Here's the thing. That can be attributed to many different things. Um, if the person was weak in their faith, sometimes they just kind of attribute to Satan something that was just a weird thought that entered their mind. Um, or it can be Satan no, did contact her. Be gone. She had it like almost every night for like years. Right. Um, it, or Satan can actually literally be contacting. Or um, in the case of, of sometimes mental trauma or mental uh, illness, like if she just has something you know wrong with so her. So it ha had to do with Satan. Maybe. Yeah. It might have. Oh. So, I mean, we can't know for sure. Um, I would, you know, there's some things you have to normally look for. Um, occultic influence in her family or in her her life. You know, does she do things like we talked about not doing, like reading horoscopes and looking and do, using the Ouija boards and that kind of stuff? Um, was she watching demonic movies and that kind of stuff, like, you know, the you exorcist know, she and that? In college with me. I, well, did she have any kind of a history of that? See, so, I mean, like, these are all things that come in, that come into play. I don't know. Well, without knowing those things, we can't know for sure. Um, it's possible, but once again, it's also possible that it was a mental issue. You know what I mean? Sometimes, here's the thing about mental issues. If you have a mental problem, like schizophrenia or whatnot, it sometimes will, I don't want to go too far off here, but sometimes if you have a religious upbringing, it will negatively impact your in illness. You know what I mean? Like, okay, let me say it differently. If you have depression... Oftentimes, if you have a religious influence throughout your life and you have depression, mental depression where you actually need like medication, it will make it worse because you'll you'll be used to the idea of guilting, guilt tripping yourself. Mm -hmm. So in other words, not only do you have a, have a chemical balance in your own – imbalance in your own head, but then you're also convicting yourself, constantly making yourself feel more guilty, and you're making the mental illness that you have worse. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So it could have been a mental illness, but it could have also been demonic oppression. I know So, um, uh, Satan focuses on distracting us, confusing us, lying to us, substituting the truth. He oftentimes won't just straight out lie. He'll just kind of half-truths and stuff. Um, he's focusing on destruction. He pretends on things. Now, here's the problem is that people just naively believe whatever he says. Spiritists and people who practice seances and, and, and the, all these people, they just like, oh, okay, you know, I contacted the spirit and they told me this, so I should just assume that what they said is true. How could how why wouldn't it be my dead grandma? You see what I mean? Um, he does keep track of the details. So things that have happened, he does. And in fact, don't make no mistake. Right now, he is plotting on how some way in the future he can he can bring you to things in, in your in, the, in your future and try and destroy you. He's always doing these things. Him and him and the demons they pay attention to what you do in life, and so they bring things by later to try and entice you back into those things. Okay. Do you think that they honestly don't know that you came out of drugs or pornography or, you know, whatever? Do you honestly think they don't know that? Um, cannot stand before the name of Jesus. This is something absolutely has to be said 100%. There is no demon in the history of demons that can ever stand against the power of Jesus. Okay. Now, here's, here's something that I want to bring up. Be careful with casting demons out of everything. Okay. Demons don't exist, all, you know, behind every corner and stuff. They are in the world, and they are, you know, working things. But don't get off with this. You know, like some people have have ministries of deliverance and ministries of this and that and other things, and just dark places. So along with this, I, won't, I also want to mention the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a lot of people are afraid that they've committed this crime, this thing because it is the unforgivable sin. What that means is there is literally nothing you can do. To be forgiven for this thing, it will be remembered in this life and the next. It is eternal damnation if you do it. So people are so paranoid that they've done it, that somehow they're just like, oh no. The 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 unforgivable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now what that means is when you attribute to the Holy Spirit something that is demonic, or attribute something to the demonic that is of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Does that make sense? So someone prophesies very obviously that it's from God and then somebody says you know Satan has spoken or something like that or the example that the gospel itself gives where Jesus is healing people and the Pharisees say ah he's doing this by the power of Satan and Satan's like okay hold up 
Okay, you can make fun of me. You can, you know, criticize me. You can do whatever you want there. You can even do that about the Father. But no blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will ever be forgiven. So that's... And then he, he even catches them in a little bit of a conundrum because he says, um, John the Baptist, w w you know, who, who sent him? What was going on there? You know, or was he was he a prophet? Was he like what what's going on with John the John the Baptist? And this, and they said, well, if we say this, he's going to say this. You know, why didn't you believe him? And if we say this, then the, then the crowd's going to kill us. We don't know Jesus. And so Jesus says, well, then neither am I going to tell you. See, I mean, because it was the same kind of idea there. Yeah. Um, and then he even he, Jesus even says this. If I'm casting out the de demons by demons, then, then how do your exorcists cast out demons? How are they doing the same thing? You know, what's going on there? So, um, hope that that brings clarity. That brings us to a person named Aleister Crowley. Now, obviously, he's not the founder of Satanism. Satanism has been around for a long time. However, uh, he was in the 1900s, uh, 1800s. And uh, very influential to not just Satanism, but uh, witchcraft and that kind of stuff, too. Um, he had the most unsure beliefs. He would convoke, invoke, invoke the name of Jesus or the name of Satan. He would he would do whatever fit the occasion. He would go to church. He didn't have any problem with that. He would go to uh, satanic cults. He would really, literally whatever. Like Aleister Crowley had the most obscure belief system. I'm not even sure if he knew what he believed. <laughs> I, I'm dead serious. Like I don't think Anton Lavey, who founded the 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 the, Satanist, the Church of Satan. Um, he had a he had at least a clarified belief system of some sort, you know what I mean? Right. But Aleister Crowley, not so much. Like it's just madness. Like whatever fit the occasion. Like and he didn't care at all, huh. like at all. Like he didn't see there being any lines between a Christian, a Satanist, a, a, an atheist, like whatever. Like whatever you want to do, just do that. That's fine. So he would he would read the Bible as sure as he would burn it. He would invoke Jesus in a ritual the same as he'd invoke Satan. Like he didn't care. Like his belief system. What was he? What wasn't he? Uh -huh. You know, he was a little bit of everything. And you know what the thing is? He never gave any indication of what he for sure believed. He wrote on things, but he never said this is what I believe. You know, I kind of practice everything. Um, he called himself the Beast six six six. Um, modern Satanism uh, believes that, uh, or some branches, I should say, believes that Marilyn Manson is the third beast, who is the final beast, and I believe Aleister Crowley is the first beast? I don't remember. Anyways, so there's these three beasts in Ma Marilyn Manson. Uh, um, <laughs> not. Mar you know what I'm saying. Yes. Thank God. For any, I wanted to say Madison. I was like, that's the president. Uh, anyways, um, he wrote the Book of the Law. Um, uh, if you're familiar with, with occultic writings, this is kind of a, a popular one. He also wrote other books as well, um, which he claims to have been given by a spirit called I I was I, I don't know how to say that, but um, I don't know if this was a spirit guide or what. But either way, later on, he he, he thought it was um, one of the Egyptian gods. He thought it was Horus, I think. But then the spirit clarified that it was. Um, God, crap, I can't remember. Um, his guardian angel, that's what it was. And, uh, yeah, so there's that. Um, it, it, he was a part of many occult groups, so there's really no way of knowing for sure. You know, He had blurred morality. I mean, I don't know if you can say that any clearer than that. And, in fact, Satanism itself has blurred morality, like, because there is no real boundary on standards. So some Satanists pretend like they're, you know, oh no, we still have we have goals and, and and but no, by definition, Satanism doesn't have goals and, and, and standards and right and wrong. It, by definition, it does, and it's the opposite of that. It's the chaos, not the, you know, Christianity is about unity. It's about you know following God. Satanism is the opposite. It's it's the idea of anarchy, about the idea of just complete freedom, complete recklessness. Um, hmm. I already talked about this. Now, uh, the Age of Horus we talked about when I mentioned the movie Nine a couple months ago. Um, the Age of Horus is basically a, a time that some people say started when the, when um, the Book of the Law was published in 1904. Some people think that it's about to happen. Um, either or, uh, it seems like the Age of Horus and the Age of Aquarius are two different things, though. Age of Aquarius is more in New Age. And it's talking about a, a, a new Christ that's going to come and the world is going to be um, perfected through the process of education and meditation and all that kind of stuff. The Age of Horus is where it's a Satanist, not New Age. And it's where 
the church age will finally end because it's something – and it, it, there's another spirit that's going to be under the dominion of that spirit for 2,000 years. Um, yeah, it, 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 here's the thing with, with the Age of Horus. Like, you're going to find 15 different conflicting views on it because – Remember, there is no form of Satanism that is the standard of Satanism. So it just depends which sect of, of Satanism you're going to talk to. But either way, the Age of Horus is a time of change. Whenever it is, whatever it is, it's a time of change. And it's either happening or, or will happen very soon. Um, and Manson claimed to be the third and final beast, so there's that. Um, John Jack Whiteside Parsons was someone who was associated uh, with Aleister Crowley. Um, he had something called the um, Agape Lodge uh which was, um, you know, connected uh, to some extent uh, to Aleister Crowley's uh, uh, occultist temple or donus or something. I forget what it's called. Um, um, and his 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 lodge that he had, Agape Lodge, actually uh, drew in a, a follower uh, who we now know as Anton Lavey. This is where Anton Lavey got his, um, I guess, dip into the pool of occultism. I guess is what you what you want to say. Um, he uh, wrote a book with L. Ron Hubbard, the guy who started Scientology, um, called Liber Forty One: The Book of Babylon. Um, now, if you're familiar with any kind of religious themes, Babylon is kind of the symbol of of evil and and and, and you know, um, state satanic. You know, it's just this, the theme of that. Even throughout the Bible. Rome, for instance, when John was writing Revelations, what is Rome called? It's not called Rome in the book of Revelations. It's called Babylon. But Babylon had been destroyed for a long time by the time of John. Why would you talk about Babylon if Babylon didn't even exist? He was talking about Rome. Uh, Peter talks about Rome as Babylon. Um, you know. Uh, so, anyways, um, and he wrote a movie and directed or directed a movie. Uh, Anyways, you can look him up. He's not that interesting overall in the theme of what we're talking about. But the idea of do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law is actually something that's been around for a long time. Some people think Aleister Crowley made that up. He didn't. Um, it, it's, it's been around since there were these um, – long story, but there were these monks or ex-monks or something like that. They had their own little order out there, and they had uh, – do what you will um, over the door, and, and then there were other people who, who had similar versions. And then it was – Reutilized at the time of, of Satanism's uprise with you know the 1900s and that kind of stuff, and to do it that will should be the whole of the law, and witchcraft uses it too, um, but we don't really know where it got started from. And it's even resurfaced as you know, follow your arrow. And yes, absolutely. Sort of um, if you're familiar with uh, modern music, uh, they have the song you know follow your arrow wherever it goes, you know, do whatever you want. Um, Anton Lavey, he was born Howard Stanton Lavey. He was raised a Catholic. Um, but he uh, he rebelled from that. Um, he saw Satan as not an actual person. Uh, he didn't believe, as far as we can tell, in an afterlife. He believed that this world was all there is to it. Um, Satan is 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 an evil force that must be um, that must be kind of harnessed for for your well being. Uh, you know, he's out there. All, you know, it, it's 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 a principle. It's like a divine unifying factor. It's in all of us. We have all that bit of evil in all of us. And, uh, you know, so obviously the desires aren't necessarily, you know, bad. Uh, the pursuit of, of, of worshipping, he defines Satanism as the pursuit of worshipping Satan, the all evil, uh, and performing acts uh, and, un, and rituals under his authority and rejecting God. The idea that God was a myth, and Satan is not a person, it's all evil, and you worship that. How do you worship that? How do you perform these acts? Well, you follow the rituals because that's how you harness that one power. But then also you you kind of just make it up as you go. Whatever you feel like doing is that that's what you do. That's 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 just how it, how it works. Um, basically, the only rule is is no rules. Um, he wrote the Satanic Bible, which was largely plagiarized um, from various other works. Um, he admitted part of this before his death, and his daughter um, uh, brought forth proof about the other thing, uh, sources that he plagiarized. Um, he started the Church of Satan. Um, there is no reason really given as to why he is an authority in, in the Church of Satan. I mean, I know he started it, but why follow what he says? Well, there's no real reason. There's no authority. There's no, like, standard of why. We follow Jesus because he's God, and he gave, gave us the Bible, and so we follow the Bible. You see what I mean? Like, like there's, there's a reason to it. There's an authority structure, a clear, uh, concise belief. With Satanism, there's no real reason to follow what Anton LaVey wrote. 
And in fact, the very nature of it says I should rebel against what Anton Lavey said because Satanism says no rules. So why should I confine myself to the rules of only following what Anton Lavey said? Which caused a lot of splinters. There's a lot of different satanic uh, churches and that kind of stuff now. There's, you know, And here's the thing, though. It's hard to know their, their numbers because they don't have public records with that. So uh, there's like the temple of Set, for instance, and then all kinds of different things like that. Now, some of the things that he emphasized, um, he has a demonic, uh, a demonic, uh, uh, what's it called, Beatitudes. Um, on here in this book, I'm going to read from it. Blessed are the strong. You guys know the Beatitudes from Matthew, right? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. And all that. Okay, so this is his rendition of that. Blessed are the strong, for they shall possess the earth. Cursed are the weak, for they shall inherit the yoke. Blessed are the powerful, for they shall be uh, reverenced among men. Cursed are the feeble, for they shall be blotted out. Blessed are those who believe those who believe what is best for them. For never shall their minds be terrorized. Basically, the idea of any kind of religion is a terror on your own mind that you yourself have, have in place on yourself. Um, life is the great indulgence, death the great abstinence. Therefore, make the most of life here and now. And that's from uh, the Satanic Bible, published in 1969. Uh, and then uh, there, here's, it has a breakdown of, of uh, some of the things. And I'm not going to read all of them, but I wanted to read some of them just to kind of give you an idea. Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. So whereas Christianity says abstain from things, Satan, Satan, Satan represents the opposite of that. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. See how he talks about Christianity and, and, and God's ways is very negative. Um, Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on integrants. So basically, Satanic, the, 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 the Church of Satan believed that um, believed in love, do it though, what shall be the whole of the law, and then it says, um, love, hold on. Crap, I wish I would have written it down, the whole thing. But it's, um, love those who... Crap, dang it. I can't remember it, guys. I'm sorry. It's, it's do what thou wilt, shall be the whole of the law. Then it says, the, the law is love, and something. Now, that sounds really good, doesn't it? Yeah. In fact, you hear a lot of Christians say something very similar to that. We're free in Christ. Do whatever you want. Uh, nope, you uh, went too far. That's not what that means. Um, um, yeah, and so then that brings up the brings up the idea. Ooh, so the Satanic Church, the Church of Satan, they teach lo love. Well, yes, but here's the thing: if somebody deserves it, yeah. <laughs> somebody deserves it, you can show them love, and only if they love you too. So like there's like these ifs ands and buts and that's not really love, <laughs> which is why the satanic once again has a has a has a different idea of love. For are you gonna read it? Go ahead. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. Yeah, there you go. Forgot that last part. Love under will. Um, huh. Okay. So what was I saying? What was I saying? You have these people. Who... About love. Yeah. Well, that's something. <laughs> I don't know. You were talking about how the Christians. Oh yes, yes, that's it. Ha <laughs> ha. Ooh yeah. Ooh wee. You wreck. Ooh. Okay. So um. You have some people who, who say, you know, hey, we're not under under the law. We can live however we see fit, and our conscience is our guide. But that's not what the Bible says. Nowhere does it say that the con our conscience is our guide in, in Scripture, does it? It says that our conscience convicts us before Jesus came. It's, it says that, that our conscience was convicting us that we knew what we were doing was right or wrong. There was something in our minds that we that we knew was wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that our conscience, even now with our with with the Holy Spirit speaking to us, doesn't mean our conscience is our guide. Scripture is our guide. What Jesus said is our guide. See what I mean? And so then that brings up, well, I'm free from the law. In a way, yes, but you're also still bound to the law. In fact, you're bound to a greater law. You're bound to the law of grace. The law of love, the true law of love. 
Basically, you have to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. You have to love your neighbor as yourself. That's a heck of a lot harder than whatever was in the law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you have to forgive people now. Okay, yeah. hey, the things that weren't... To. Do what? Yeah. Even if you don't want to. And in fact, if you don't forgive people, Jesus, God's not going to forgive you either. That's a pretty big statement. Yeah. You know, that's a lot harder. Um, also, we still can If we truly love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, we can't practice homosexuality. No. We can't worship idols. We can't... See what I mean? Like, that doesn't mean that we're free to act however we want. That means we're free from the law. We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. We can directly approach God through Christ. Right. That's what that means. Yeah. See what I mean? That doesn't mean that we're lawless now. In fact, Paul even says this, don't use your freedom as, a, as an excuse for sin. Wait, there's sin? Sin still exists? Yes, sin still exists. Yeah. The law showed that sin existed. The problem with the law is that it only showed that sin existed. It didn't show the way out from that. So grace and Christ's coming brought grace from the law, but there is still a standard. Whereas in Satanism it says, do what thou wilt shall be the entirety of the law. But we don't believe that do what thou wilt. We believe do what God wills shall be the whole of our law, right? And that's loving God and loving your neighbor, which encompasses a bunch of other things. See what I mean? There's a whole other thing that's going on there. Um... And it's not what we will. We are not our own. In fact, Satan, I mean, the Bible even talks about us being God's slaves. Yeah. That's a pretty big, pretty big term. So I think we're going to stop there because it's a little late, guys. Um, next week we'll, well, no, let's look at this. Well, no. What time is it? More slides. No, it's 8.16. Oh, no, I still have like, uh, uh, let's see, seven, about seven more slides. Oh, well, no, then I have the closing slides, so six more slides. Wait, four, five, six, seven. I have six more slides. Uh, the seventh slide is the question of the week. So, um, and, the, and, the, and then we're going to talk about demonic possession and that kind of stuff. Um, you know what? I can get I can get through it pretty fast. I'm going to go ahead and keep going. If you guys have to leave, that's fine. Um, I'll post it tomorrow. Tomorrow, if you want to, you know, um, it's not going to be that long for the rest of it. Um, we really talked about the. We're done talking about the Church of Satan. Um, so signs of possession. These are how you can tell if it's a men if it's not a mental illness, okay? These kinds of signs, okay? Uh, a mental illness is not going to have these things. A different personality, which is a thing in mental mil mental illnesses. That doesn't mean that you're demon possessed just because you exhibited a different personality. But there's a certain that look that comes on demon possessed people in their face where it contorts their face and look like a different person. Yeah. So that should be noted. Um, Multiple voices, oftentimes speaking at the exact same time. Okay, in fact, you'll see one person's mouth, but they'll be like like an entire auditorium room. Um, different languages spoken, not just English, not just languages that the person knows. Um, superhuman strength. This is a, a very common sign that when when the one demon a demon possessed guy approached Jesus, he had torn his chains and they couldn't do anything about him. He was just too strong. Um, it's not uncommon during exorcisms for people uh, like s seven or eight men to try and hold down one guy that's just a scrawny or a little girl, you know, not like a little girl, like a, a girl. I'm I'm sure that too, but I meant like a small, thin girl. Um, blasphemy, very very common. Um, that is uh, there is actually some some very accurate details in the movie The Exorcist. Some very accurate details. Um, uh, blasphemy, they, they have a distaste, a complete, utter contempt for the things of God. Uh, levitation, floating, and that kind of stuff. Uh, foul smells, very oh, common. Can I make a comment? Yes. My aunt, um, she lives up in Ohio, mm -hmm. and she was laying in bed one night, and the smell of like death and rotting came in her room. Mm -hmm. She said, believe in the name of Jesus Christ, and it stopped. Like she said, it's just, she can't explain yeah. how it smelled. Like, yeah. It's just... It, it's it's a smell. It's, yeah. Here's the thing: when <laughs> when you've seen someone that's demon possessed, like you won't doubt it anymore. Like it's just something that you see and you're like, oh, yeah, holy yeah, smokes, it's real. <laughs> that's something. <laughs> uh, foul smells, uh, very very common. Um, desecration of the sacred, like I say, uh, with demon possession, if you mention the name of Jesus, they go crazy. You know, if you'll want to read to them from the Bible, they'll. If you can get them to touch the Bible, they'll oftentimes take a Bible. In fact, demons will oftentimes touch a Bible in a seance. Um, but they, you know, the person will just kind of like, you know, they'll criticize something about it, anything. Like uh, we gave we gave a Bible to the demon possessed guy, 
And uh, he looked at trans version, like, you know, what does that mean? You know, making fun of the fact that, you know, it's, you know, obviously he was just wrong. But demons, you know, they don't really thrive on truth. Um, Self-destructive. Uh, people who are demon-possessed will usually not care about that. You know, very destructive things like running around, beating yourself, cutting yourself, that kind of stuff. Now, just because you're cutting on yourself doesn't mean you're demon-possessed. I, I know a lot of high schoolers that cut on themselves out of depression and that kind of stuff, which should definitely be treated. Should def they should definitely get help. But that's not necessarily demon possession. Um, conflicted. If you look at the man uh, that ran to Jesus, for instance, he ran to Jesus and at the same time said, no, leave us alone. Well, you say yes and you say no. Which one do you want? You know what I mean? Like, And that's a very, very common thing with uh, demon possessed people. They'll come to you for help, but then when you're trying to help them, they'll say, no, 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 I don't want your help. You know, so this is very, very common. Um, resistant to God, absolutely. There, There is no illness that I know of that makes you act like a demon-possessed person acts towards the things of God. There's not a single one that I know of. Like, even schizophrenia, it doesn't make you blasphemous. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't... It... It's hard to it's hard to explain it if if you've never seen a demon possessed person. Uh, anyways, uh, clairvoyance things that, that they know things that that aren't necessarily where they are, like what happened in another state over when they weren't there. Well, because the demons you know relate knowledge to them. Demons will quote the Bible. They'll claim to be angels or Christians. They'll claim to be dead relatives. Um, they, there is a distinction from mental illness, and you have to look for you have to look for the kind of vibe. You know what I mean? That's just kind of difference. And I don't use the word vibe because that's you know we were talking about new age, and that's the idea of new age. But I mean, the, just a different kind of Can't you just feel. Like sense evil? Just like not always. Not always. Um, sometimes you can. Sometimes you can't. Um, sometimes it's just it. It seems real. I mean, for instance, all the psychiatrists uh, who encounter demon possessed person are saying, "Nah, it's fine. They just need some meds." So, I mean, like it, it just really depends. Uh, there was this kid that I went to Michael's church on, off and on, and he went to camp and they cast a demon out of him. He was a he was a youth pastor's son. Yeah, and I I, I didn't know. I mean, I met him once or twice. So I was like, yeah. Just, yeah. And a lot of times there'll be the other things involved too, like. Uh, you know, drug abuse and that kind of stuff, and so they won't, you won't know because they'll be acting crazy anyways. Right. Have you ever seen someone who's strung out on meth, guys? Yeah. They are crazy. Yeah. Like, there's no way to know that they're not demon possessed because they act crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's complete nonsense. <laughs> they they roam around. They they talk to themselves. They yell and and dance around. They're just crazy. They they, they attack people for no apparent reason. They, they have like <laughs> dramatic mood swings. The, right. Sometimes they'll just collapse all of a sudden and pop up like nothing. I mean, it's just. They're crazy. How do you distinguish that from a demon possessed person? <laughs> there was a guy on Cops one time that he he was on meth and he just went out and just laid in the street naked at like yeah. three in the morning and I think I saw that. And the cops came up and they're like, Hey, you know, what are you doing? And he's like, What is what day is this? And they're like, Well, it's such a such he's like, I've been up for three days. Oh my <laughs> I just needed to take it out. Yeah, I remember that. He's like, "Well, let's get out of the street." Yeah, so, <laughs> so how and who? You know, how how are you demon possessed, and who can be demon possessed? Christians cannot be demon possessed. It's absolutely impossible. And the reason why is because we have we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is a very jealous God, and He does not share His abode with anybody, anybody. And as long as the Holy Spirit is there, a demon cannot exist. Here, here, because here's the thing: demons are absolutely petrified of the name of Jesus. Okay. Like, like Nicole just told that story, that was a genuine demonic encounter because, A, she said the name of Jesus, and she once again, there was, an, there was a very a, a, pung, a smell, a very a very obvious sign of demonic activity. She said the name of Jesus, it instantly left. Well, like what happened with me a couple of weeks ago with that, mm -hmm. that tap, just saying the name of Jesus, it went away. Mm -hmm. Like, it just... And here's the thing, though. Sometimes with demonic, it won't be instantly when you mention the name of Jesus. You have to stick with it. And you have to kind of get involved with prayer. So, yeah. so just because it doesn't instantly leave doesn't mean that. See what I mean? Yeah. You have to, we have to be careful. Um, okay. Um, and there's other things that can be said about this. There is no example anywhere of a Christian ever being demon possessed. And some people will say, "Oh, well, I know of this one person." 
That's what we call a tear among the wheat, right here. Blam. Um, actually, it's on the next slide, I think. Um, it's called a tear among the wheat. It's someone who looks like a Christian, acts like a Christian, says all the Christian things, but they're not a Christian. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's hard to explain, but they do exist. Um, if you are a genuine Christian, and you'll know because you'll be growing in Christ. Read First John. He shows he tells you the signs of how you know that you're a Christian. You'll be growing in Christ. You'll be doing the things of God. You'll ha you'll have love for people. You will forgive people. You you won't hold on to your bitterness. See, what I mean, you'll turn from sin. You won't just walk in sin and accept it. Um, he says a lot of different things in there. Uh, there's a man, Daniel Holm, uh, who I believe was, was a doctor, if I remember correctly. Uh, he was a, a, a spiritist, held seances and different things like that. He grew up in a Christian house, supposedly, but his mom was was also a witch. And so he grew up with this kind of stuff. When she died, uh, the spirits started contacting him, and they had him convinced that it was God speaking to him. And so his entire life, he thought, was in the service of God. And he thought that it was just Christians being too too dogmatic. Wow. And uh, obviously he'd ignored everything the scripture says about that. Mm -hmm. Because the demons told him that they were from God. You know, for instance, he said the name of Jesus. Now listen to this. Somebody, uh, he was with his, I believe it was his aunt, uh, said, said the name of Jesus. And, and it kept knocking on the table. And so then she threw the, ta threw the Bible on it. And on the table, and the table started started levitating less sporadically and more like it was uh, honoring and, and, and reverencing the Bible, mm -hmm. which convinced him. Through, other things happened too, but throughout the process, it convinced him that it was God speaking and not the demons because they pretended to have a reverence for the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. They had him convinced that it was God speaking. See what I mean? That's yes, absolutely. And here's the thing. Why did it contact him? Because his mom was so involved in it. When you let it in the house, it has more of a chance going to your other, to other people in the house. Yeah. Okay? Um, so that's why I say when you're looking out, when you're trying to watch out for demon position, it's not just how have you been influenced, have those directly around you been influenced with the demonic. See what I mean? Oftentimes, demons get kind of comfortable with areas and people. So, for instance, if you live in a house where a witch used to live, or or a, or a, or someone who uses Ouija boards and that kind of stuff, um, you know, you might notice some strange things, and you, which typically cause people to say that the house is haunted. But the house isn't really haunted. Demons just kind of get used to certain places. So, what you do in that kind of situation? You have to cast them out of the house. I mean, it's Sounds stupid, but that's what you got. You got to do. You know, you, you pray and, and and you pray in the name of Jesus. Because here's the thing, and we'll get to that later. Um, okay. Um. So those exposed to cult activity or those close to those who have been, uh, if you're if you are fr fascinated with the demonic or overly are afraid of it, these are two things to watch out for because that opens up the de opens up the door for demons to be able to influence your life through it. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And don't be fascinated by it. That's why I don't watch movie, watch movies like The Exorcist. It's it draw it causes people to be fascinated with the demonic, and it causes you to fear, not to stand in faith. I wasn't I wasn't at the um, stage one time. Which stage? And, um, being afraid, to walk through the house uh -huh. because I thought, you know, and I um I start getting to a point where I start singing, so my mind would be off of it. Mm-hmm. You know what? All, it, that, and it took me a long time to yeah. overcome it. And here's the thing, though: don't leave fear alone. If you are afraid of this, clearly and concisely address the fear. Cause yourself to do something that you're afraid to do, like walking in the dark or something like that. And while you're doing it, pray in the name of Jesus audibly. Okay, does that make sense? Because what happens is, if you don't address that fear, the demonics, will, the demonic realm will just keep influencing you through that fear. See what I mean? And eventually they will get a, foot, a foothold in your life because you've allowed them to have a foothold in your life. You are convinced that they can do something, so they will do something. See what I mean? It, our, 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 how, we, how we believe things really affects um, how it happens. Um, so these, kind of, these are how we open up the door to oppression. Uh, Matthew 12, uh, 30, 43 through 45, says kind of the, the, the way this goes. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless spaces places seeking rest and does not find it then it says i will return to my house from which i came and when it comes it finds it unoccupied swept and put in order then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first that is the way it will be with this evil generation so there's a few things to notice that he's saying here a few very important things to notice that he's saying there 
Now, the first is, did you know that demons are in torment? They're always in torment. Okay? And when they possess someone, it brings them some form of comfort and relief. So they're actively pursuing. This is not something just objective for them. Like, ah, if we possess them, it's fine. This is something that, that makes them feel more comfortable. Okay? So there is that. Um, uh, they have the ability to occupy, uh, occupy space. Think of it, like, and it says in here, like a parasite. That's a perfect analogy. Think of it like a parasite. There is some form of, of spiritual longing in us that needs to be filled, and that will be filled by the demonic or Holy Spirit. There, there is no other way of it. Um, demons are multidimensional. He says here he goes through dry places. See there? Um, and now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, so it was in the man, second, it passes through waterless places, so it, it can go through dimensional travel. Um, not, it's not just bound to the to the realm of, to the realm of the demonic. Um, it says it seeks rest. Uh, so something in, in the in the demonic world causes them to need rest. Now we shouldn't think of rest in the same way as we rest, like sleep. Some form of they need to be build back up their strength somehow. Hmm. And something about possessing somebody. Builds that strength up. How does that work? I don't know. But and that's nevertheless what it says. Um, it passes through wireless spaces seeking rest and does not find it. Um, so that's something that's actually very important there. It does not find it. Demons are in a constant state of agitation and persecution and, and tribulation, in a constant state of it. Demons are always in that state. They're, they're, they're away from the presence of God. They live in a constant state of fear. And they know the end that awaits them because they've heard what the prophets have said, right? Yeah. They know what their what their end is going to be. They live in a constant state of fear. Remember that, okay? Um, then he says, "I will return to my house from which I came." Now, do you see how possessive that was? His house. Who was his house? The person. The person was his house. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied. Um, so the idea here is that the person doesn't have God in them. They just try to clean up their act. They just try to do better. Notice how it says here, when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, uh, swept, and put in order. The person has cleaned up their life. They're, you know, they're, they're not. These people aren't bad people necessarily, but the, uh, God's not in them. Um, <clears throat> so often, uh, here's the thing. Oftentimes we convince ourselves that because we look the right way, I go to church. You know, I, I, hey, I, I, you know, you see this a lot in bigger towns. You know, I'm on the choir. We don't have a choir. We have just a little worship team. But, you know, that's like the sign of, of holiness and the Southern Baptist ideas, you know. <laughs> if you're in the choir, everybody's in the choir. Um, then it goes and, and takes along with it seven other spirits. Now, there is a few things that I wanted to mention uh, from this book. Um, so the person's vulnerable. Um, one thing here is that it... The demon had to seek help to get back into the person. Hmm. When humans' life, when people's lives are damaged, it's easier for demonic activity. But if someone's, if the demon's cast out and the person cleans up their act, doesn't have sit, have God, but cleans up their act and, and you know, does better, it's going to be harder for the demon to go back in. However, he'll just get more homeboys to go with him. And see what I mean? So, um, and also, it's important to note here. This is a very important fact. Um, it says spirits more wicked than itself. So not all demons are equal. Some are more wicked, some are less wicked. How the heck does that work? I don't know. Um, and also the idea that, that was written in here, it says the more evil a demon is, the more powerful he is. And that seems to be the theme that Jesus is saying here. Um, and there's no, no, no protection because the Holy Spirit's not there. And it says here at the last part of it that... Um, the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. In other words, the person becomes more evil than they were before when their life was ruined and they first encountered the demonic. That's kind of a powerful statement. So do you have to be afraid? Nope, not at all. Not at all. There is nothing about the demonic for us to fear. Don't let it in your house and don't play with it. But don't fear it. So what do you do if it's in your house? You get rid of it. <laughs> um, demonic oppression is different than demonic possession. Yeah, it's fine. I'll post it tomorrow, okay? Um, demonic op oppression is different than demonic uh, possession. Believing yourself to be a Christian doesn't make you one, okay? Now, de demonic possession uh, is is 
different than, than possession this. Possession comes from, from within. Oppression comes from without. Does that make sense? In other words, a, a Christian can be demonically oppressed in the sense that, um, excuse me, that um, maybe they'll have a harder time sleeping. Um, maybe they'll struggle with depression, that kind of stuff. You know, they'll be assaulted. But these are things from outside that Satan and the demonic, you know, try and claws away with. Whereas with possession, it's something that is within you. You know how the Holy Spirit is within you, right? Yeah. In that same way, the demon is within you. See what I mean? So can you be demon-possessed and not know it? No. Impossible. You will know. Just the same as you know if you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. You just know. You just know. Um, um, so these, these would be the examples of tares in the wheat. And people think that these are the exceptions to the rule. But I know this one Christian who is, nope, they're not really a Christian if they got possessed. Not really a Christian. It is impossible for a, demon, for a Christian to be demonically possessed. Um, some signs of oppression would be spiritually wounded. Um, apathetic spiritually. You don't just don't really care about people. Uh, living in sin or living in rebellion. These are these are good examples of, of, of how. But with that being said, just because you're struggling with these things doesn't mean that you're necessarily losing the battle. Okay. There's also some people who have uh, physical problems. Um, you know, be it um, you know mental or whatever that causes some of these same things. So keep in mind that sometimes it'll be Satan. In intentionally trying to attack you and tear you down, and sometimes it'll just be the fact that your body is aching for its glorified rev revival in the future, I guess, is how you could say that. Um, so, how do you fight demonic oppression? Well, if you're demonically possessed, you need to go, <laughs> go to a Christian. <laughs> so there's that. But if you're demonically oppressed, there are definitely ways that the Bible talks about fighting it. The first is with Scripture. Jesus, as Satan came to Jesus and tried to tried to tried to get him to turn aside from what his plan was. Now, see, the thing is, it's kind of a catch twenty two. Had he worshipped Satan, he would have been given all all the kingdoms of the world, right? And he wouldn't have had to die. To he wouldn't have had to go through that whole nonsense because he would have gotten it anyways, right? But here's the thing: if Jesus would have done that, then he wouldn't have actually been Jesus. Well, because Jesus cannot sin. Go ahead. Yeah. Satan would have actually given him that. He wouldn't have been Satan because he's the father of lies. Right. And and, and here's another thing, too. Um, oh, crap. Last mention of that. Um, it was about Jesus with that. He couldn't have. Um, oh, yes. Satan only had that authority because God gave it to him. Yeah. Right. So, see what I mean? Like, it's just this whole thing. <laughs> um. So scripture is the first way. Prayer is the second way. And here's the thing. There are some things that will only be resolved through prayer and fasting. Some Christians don't think that fasting is, is, a, is something that we have to do still. Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. And you will be limited in, in your spiritual warfare without fasting. Fasting is just something that's absolutely needed. There's something great about fasting where you put to death your flesh to focus on God. When you don't eat and you're not exercising, you're not wasting your time with those other things, and you're just tuning into the Lord, after you go past the stage of thinking that you're going to die from lack of food, there's a stage right after that where you spiritually you're very open to what God has to say. I don't know how else to say it. Um, repenting, turning. That mean, to repent means to turn away from what you're doing. So you're doing something wrong. Repenting means stop doing that and turn in the other direction. Right. It's an it's a, it's a it's an intentional thing. Rededicating your life to Christ. You have to rededicate your life to Christ every time that you sin. However, you'll know that you've kind of just kind of backed away and kind of gotten involved with things you shouldn't. And if those situations happen, then there's always the option of rededication. Um, resisting. The Bible says in James, for instance, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you feel like the like you're being demonically oppressed, resist it. Stand firm, because you know that Satan will flee. Um, put on the armor of God. Now, we talked about how this isn't actually a literal set of armor, but Ephesians talks about these things. You know, faith, for instance, is one of them. Our salvation, you know, stand firm in that. Um, and always, 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 I want to say that, I'm going to say this in just a little bit, always pray in the name of Jesus. Do not pray in your own strength. Um, Jude actually has something to say about that. So, overcoming possession, renounce Satan and accept Jesus, confessing your sin. 
that's it, it that's the first thing if if you're if somebody is demonically uh, possessed you take them to a christian or or if you are the person you you know obviously it's going to be hard and it's going to be a fight but um do what you can to get there <coughs> Uh, and then uh, after the demon is cast out, you have to renounce him verbally. Here's the thing about this, okay? A lot of people have had a demon cast out, and because they do not renounce Satan, he still has a hold on their life. Yeah. See what I mean? So you have to verbally renounce Satan. Satan, I renounce you. I renounce these things that I've done. I used to do these things. I'm no longer doing these things anymore. I reject this. I am now a part of. I'm one of God's children. Then you have to accept Jesus. Renouncing Satan without accepting Jesus is pointless. There's no reason in it. And Jesus is your safeguard. He's your safety net. He's the life preserver when you're in the deep waters. That's the only thing that's going to keep you afloat. So if you don't accept Jesus, I mean, why even renounce Satan? Why not just go ahead and go back to Satan and invite the demons back in? Um, and then you have to. Con this is a process of confessing your sin, turning from your sins, repent and destroy all signs of the old. Stop your contact with people who are involved with the occult. Destroy every item of the cult that you have. Uh, don't go to those places anymore. Um, set up, um, get uh, an oil, for instance, and anoint your house with oil and pray in the name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit would, would um, protect you and would protect your house. Because remember, demons do get kind of attached to things. They get possessive about things. And so they've, they're used to spending time in your house, and they're just not going to want to give that up. You know, it's just not something they're going to be like, hey, yeah, it's fine, whatever. You want to accept Jesus, that's fine. You know, like, th there is going to be a, an actual fight that goes on there. Um, and so there has to be complete surrender to God. If you try and hold back, if you try and not really let the Holy Spirit have his way and remake you, you're like, oh, I'll go to church, but I don't know. You see what I mean? If there's not that complete surrender of, Lord, have my life, I want to only serve you, I want to only, you know, only, it's all about you, God. If there's not that complete surrender, like, it's just, it's just not going to happen. Um... And obviously, uh, after that, you have to stay firm by staying in prayer and staying in Scripture. So just some concluding... Oh, that was that was the last note there, prayer and Scripture. Uh, so just some, some conc concluding thoughts here. There, I think there's two sides. Never fear the satanic. Never embrace it. And never get too close to it. But never fear it. There's nothing, absolutely nothing to fear about in the satanic. Or the demonic, I guess I should say. God can save anyone. Don't write people off and don't write yourself off. There's no personal life that God cannot save. Um... Don't underestimate Satan's power. Jude 8 through 10 gives a very, very, very good warning that here's the thing a lot of name it and claim it people completely ignore. And I think it's very dangerous because what happens is you basically say, okay, okay, demons, let's go, let's have a, let's have a match, uh, let's have a, have a little battle here. And obviously you're going to lose because you're fighting in your own strength. Jude uh, 8 through uh, 11 says this, yet in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile Angel, angelic ma uh, majesties. Now that's the last. That's the thing I want to notice. Revile angelic ma majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued uh, about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him Satan a, rel a relling judgment, but said, "The Lord rebuke you." See what he just said? You guys are opening your mouths about things that you don't know about. How many times have you heard people say that with the, with the demons? Mm -hmm. Either they, they resort to name calling. Satan's just a big dummy. Or they resort to thinking that they're big and bad because they're a Christian, right? So they say, you know, oh, Christian, oh, Satan, Satan, you get out of here. You know what I mean? It's just like real flippant. Here's the thing. I'm not saying you have to honor the demons or the demonic realm. I'm saying that there needs to be a healthy respect where you realize that they have a lot of power, okay? And then you realize that you're protected by the blood of Christ, but that it doesn't mean that you play with fire, right? Like the seven sons of Sceva. Like the seven sons of Sceva. You know, if you read the Bible, there's a lot of examples of these kinds of things. But here's the, here's the thing I really want to get, because we, you guys go to what's called a Pentecostal church. And a lot of Pentecostal churches, there is a lot of, of, of I guess, well-meaning people who blaspheme demons. And who say things about the demons like they're trying to pick a fight with demons. This is a really bad idea. First off, like, don't go looking for the demonic. That's the first thing I want to say. Okay, if it shows up, then address it. But don't go looking for it. What were you going to say? They'll call them a punk and stuff like that. Yeah. Literally. Well, no, but seriously, or some of them are even stupid enough, yeah, to like try and call for demons so they can cast them out. It's like, are you retarded? <laughs> don't go looking for demons. Okay? That's, that's, the, that's the first thing. Second off, remember that it's not you casting them out. 
And it's always in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Always in the name of Jesus. Never, ever get in a spiritual battle by trying your own strength. And the third thing is, just stay away from demonic things if you're, you know, trying to help people who are doing this and that kind of stuff. If you have not been actively in prayer and reading your Bible and, and every once in a while fasting too. If you're not actively growing spiritually and you're not actively in that devotional life, there is no way you should even get involved with that. Well, I can't just leave this person who's demon possessed. It will be better for you if you do. It'll be better for them too. Like mm -hmm. if it's like this, if you're not prayed up, that's just the end of that. <laughs> like it, it, there, there is certain certain things like you know we just need to be aware of these kinds of things. So once again, don't be afraid of these things, but also remember that there's a very real war going on. Um, uh, there was a man who was in it. I'm just going to tell a few stories. There was a man who got into the cult because um, you know he was lonely and that kind of stuff. Anyways, uh, he he eventually became trapped and he felt like he, he couldn't get out of it, you know. And so he tried to smoke and it burned his lips. The cigarette was burning his lips. He just didn't know why. So he's like, okay, that's weird. So he tried to drink, and it tasted real bad. And he had to spit it out. He couldn't he couldn't drink the alcohol, and so he's sitting there crying on his bed because he lives in this witch. I think it was a witch coven. You know, so they were all out, but I mean, there's not much you could do. And a very audible voice said, "Get out!" And he's all like, "Well, what the crap?" And he all he stops praying. And he's all just looking around, like I mean, he stops crying. And he's just looking around, like, "What? What's going on?" And Jesus literally appeared to him and said, "Get out right now!" And so he climbed out the window and left and gave his heart to God in the driveway of the house. And he went on to get his master's degree and started up a ministry. Um, called something refuge ministries or something like that that actually helps people who, who are in who are in you know bad situations so very cool uh, another story uh, a woman who who came uh, uh, to a, a church and had 56 demons in her and uh, you know they were all speaking at one time and so uh, they had to be commanded stop it <laughs> then they kept trying to talk in other in other languages they, they had to command them in the name of Jesus to speak in English and then they did upon the command of Jesus, not yourself. You also don't have to conjure power within yourself. Okay? Some people think that when they have to pray, they have to really feel it. You really have to work themselves up. That's not really how it works at all. Okay? At all. So keep that in mind. Anyways, and so they then they asked the names of the demons, and they got a total, a head count of all the demons, and it was total 56, and so then they started casting them out one by one, and by the end of the night, she was completely free. Um, so a lot of people say don't don't talk to demons. Well, yes and no. Don't try and communicate with demons. But if someone's demon possessed, like even Jesus talked to the demons, and he said, you know, for instance, with Legion, he said, how many are, or what's your name? And and the demons said in one voice, Legion, because we're many. See, God, God Himself showed us the example of casting out the demons. There's nothing in Scripture that ever says don't talk to the demon while you're casting people out. But there's the flip side of that. Don't try to communicate with demons. Don't go out of your way. Don't try and seek after them, that kind of stuff. But if you're trying to cast demons out of a person, there's going to have to be some kind of back and forth between you and the demon. You see what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, There was a woman who uh, was actually not unlike what you were saying uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, there was a woman who uh, was uh, paralyzed in her bed every single night that she went to bed for, for months. And um, she... Well, honestly, she wouldn't get rid of the things that she was holding on to, and so it was a constant problem. She didn't have the power in the name of Jesus because she was not washed in the blood of Jesus. So as though she was technically maybe possibly a Christian, maybe, the things of the cult were still a part of her household. The demons, I mean, the, the movies were, were still in her house. The, the You know, all these things that influenced her, they were still in her house. And... Uh, so there's all if if you do not wholeheartedly commit your life to God, you will struggle with the demonic. There is no it's not people think in America that you can play like half Christian. That doesn't actually happen in anything except for our imagination. Like that just doesn't happen. Um, here's another story. Uh, there was a woman who was actually publicly speaking, um, and she was definitely a Christian, and uh, she uh, uh, demons uh, muted her mouth where um, she became confused and couldn't think of the words and she couldn't speak. It wasn't like a panic attack. It was like um, demonic oppression. And she, she had to stop in the middle of her public speaking, and she had to pray in the spirit, and then th then she got the victory and the, the demons left, and so she continued speaking. 
that can happen, okay? For whatever reason, we have this in this, you know, hey, the demonic doesn't exist, and it's fine. They're just going to leave us alone, and we're going to leave him alone, and we're going to all pretend like he doesn't exist anymore. And it's like, okay, that's not really how it works, though. Um, there was a, a boy who was supposedly a Christian, but he has a, had a Ouija board that he was playing with, and uh, he got bored, and so he was, you know, was talking to it and everything. And then finally he said, who's Jesus? You know, what's the deal with that? And it became very angry, and it started spinning around and stuff. And... Uh, it, it, I, if I remember correctly, it actually was picked up and flown, and flown against the wall. And he's like, okay, that was creepy. So he took it out and burned it. And he's like, I, I'm done with that. Hmm. Um, uh, there was a witch who hated church um, and, you know, had always been in the church. Her whole family had always been, I mean, had always been in, in covens. Her whole family had always been in covens, um, which is kind of like a group of witches. Um, and... Uh, it's kind of like a church of witches. There's usually, I think, there's thirteen in a coven, and you know that kind of stuff. We'll look at witches next week. Uh, uh, and uh, she was just overcome with this desire to go to church, and she's like, "I hate Christians. I don't even like God. Like, what the heck is going on here?" Anyway, she eventually went, and uh, she said that uh, she just felt a, a love and a peace that she never felt before, and eventually she ended up getting saved. Um, so God can literally touch anyone. Um, there was a Christian woman, woman who read the horoscope until finally she started believing in it, and then she start, had to go to the pastor and she said, "You know, I, I'm having problems making decisions. I, I just I feel very um, spiritually what's it called malaise. Um, you know, uh, yeah. you know what Blase. I mean? Okay, yeah, blase. Is that what you said? Yeah, very spiritually, just like you know. And uh, well, what happened is she just got too close, you know, obviously, which is why I go to the other side and say, just don't even, don't even mess with it. I don't read that part of the paper. I don't read the fortune cookies. You know, just stay away from it. Um, there's, there's, there's examples of this kind of stuff happening. And, you know, she had to go to the pastor for, for counseling. It was a while before she gained any victory over that. Um, there was a, another woman who had 100 demons and Walter Martin was there speaking in conference and he left and he was at his hotel four hours away and they called him and said, you know, Hey, um, what do we do? <laughs> and so he, he he told them what to do. He hung up the phone. And he prayed for the next four hours. Then they called him back and said, the last one finally left. And he's like, are you sure? He's like, yes. So we commanded him to speak, and there's nothing he answered. So there's nothing else in there. And so she ended up being saved. And so she she went on the phone and, you know, talked to him and said, you know, how, how, how thankful she was and everything. Um, so the Bible says two very relevant scriptures. The first is that the gates of hell will not overcome God's church. Not it may get a full foothold every once in a while. It cannot overcome. Like literally, Satan cannot overpower Jesus. No way, no how, ever. Okay? That's just how that goes. Well, I tried praying once and the name of Jesus didn't have, didn't seem to work. You're either not saying in prayer. You're not really a Christian. And you need to you need to stop screwing around and get your life serious. Genuinely devote your life to God and get on track because you can't be playing around with that kind of nonsense. Um, or um, you didn't stick with it for long enough. So, I mean, sometimes even Jesus, when he was casting out demons, not every time that he was that he was casting them out did they come out instantly. You know, it, it, I think it's in Mark. He said, uh, "So then Jesus said this to the demon because it had not come out yet." In other words, Jesus was attempting to cast it out, and it didn't work at first. He had to stick with it. So Jesus got more information from it to find out why. Um, so, anyways. Hours, yeah, if absolutely. Not a day or more. I mean, depending on. And here's the thing that I found out after the fact of uh, trying to cast demons out of someone: if there are multiple demons and you're only trying to cast out one demon and you don't know that there's multiple demons, oftentimes they won't come out because you have to dress them specifically, one by one. Hmm. And so, if there are multiple demons in somebody and you, and you try and cast out the demons and it doesn't come out because you think it's just one. So I mean, like that's a whole thing there. Um, and then also, um, can you cast out a demon if someone is unwilling? Absolutely. Uh, that's actually in the Bible, where people are not willing, and still the demon gets cast out of them. So that is fully possible. Um, some people think that demons will not come out if the person is unwilling to. It may be harder. Maybe harder. It might be a little bit foolish. <coughs> but you can. Um, the question then becomes, should you cast out a demon... <coughs> If the person doesn't want the demon cast out, because it'll just end up worse for them in the end. That's something you're gonna have to listen to God on. Like, that's something I don't have an answer to. And then the same thing that's very relevant for this discussion is the the ending of Matthew, where it says, "All authority on earth has been given to me." 
all this, I have authority over it. That thing that Jesus tried to tempt me with, I actually have that authority. So, let's keep things in perspective here. Now I'm telling you to go into all the ends of the world and make, and make disciples. I mean, because he has all authority, that's why we go. So, um, never forget that when you're talking about the, the occult. Um, the Bible, the Bible that that's 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 our, our our defense right there. A lot of people try and not uh, read the Bible. They try and reject the Bible, and you know it's not really relevant. It's not accurate. It's all these different things. Even though it is, it's totally accurate. It's totally relevant. And you know, and they say, well, I'm not going to read the Bible. All these things, and then they try and carry on through life. What are you going to oppose the demonic with? Your your dreams of fancy. Um, and so God is our is our really our only defense. He's the one who gave us the Bible. You can be prepared. Uh, how can you be prepared to deal with these kinds of things? Once again, don't go looking for it. But if it comes, how can you know you'll be prepared? Stay in the Word and stay in prayer. That's it. That's easy. That's easy. Don't be paranoid that one day it might come because it might come someday. But don't worry about it. Um, so what are some? This is the question of the week. What are some uh, themes that have been accepted in, in some forms? What are some occult themes that have been accepted in some form in modern Christianity? We're good? Any questions? I just wanted to add a comment. Go ahead. Um, I watched this episode of Ghost Adventures one time, uh -huh. and they were talking, uh, they were visiting the house that inspired the exorcist. Uh-huh. And they took in a Ouija board, which I'm still questioning it, because he proclaims to be Christian. Right. But anyways, he asked who they were speaking to and who was coming through the board, and clear, it clearly said Satan. Like, it was, you know... Holy smokes, like, that's just not a good idea. Like, it's just not a good idea. <laughs> um, one thing, uh... Oh, like this. Playing on the, uh, the thing that you said earlier of how demons will will use, you know, whatever you believe that's what they're going to come up to. And they will they if if you believe they're more powerful than you or that they're gonna come at you and make you think that they're yeah. stronger than you. Um one time Skip Heitzig said that him and uh him and this one guy were were in his office and he's, I think, like six foot five, and uh, this other guy, he was, he was over six foot tall in that. Well, this this real small woman comes in, mm -hmm. and I guess she had come in for like counseling or something, and she just takes the one guy up and just holds him like choke hold Holy crap. up against the wall. Holy crap! <laughs> and you know he's like, what do you do in that moment? Well, if you freak out, you know you're gonna give them. Yeah. Authority over you, no, but right. you you know you got to stand in in who you are. Um, another thing is like when uh, we moved into the house over there, you know I knew that my great grandma had Ouija boards in there and all kinds of stuff, you know. So one of the first things I did was to just go in there and pray and say, you know. Satan, whatever authority you've had in here, it's <laughs> it's it's gone now, no. you know. Um, and sometimes we we forget that on stuff, you know, maybe not even in our family or that, but no. who had who was doing stuff there before you, no. and what did they allow in? And kind of following against that, I heard along with that, I heard of a family that kept having all these problems in their house, mm -hmm. just like nightmares and everything. And they were a really strong Christian family. Well, they went to change out the carpet up in the attic where their daughter's room was, and there was a parent grand painted on the floor. So there had been some some kind of activity there. And like there. a couple on the walls, like that they had just been painted over. Hmm. Once they got painted over and blessed the house, everything was fine. No. I, no. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say I've always heard anytime you ever move into a new house, always like you know pray over it to make mm -hmm. sure God has authority over the house. Now, here's something that I failed to mention earlier in the lesson. Um, when Jesus, I mean, yeah, when Jesus is talking to Peter, and Peter says, "Lord, let this never happen," and then Jesus responds like this: "He says, get behind me, Satan." Okay, he doesn't address Peter; he addresses Satan. But who was speaking? Peter. Was Peter? Excuse me. Was Peter demon possessed? No, not at all. 
But what happens is Satan, like, remember I said Satan can communicate to our spirit, our innermost being? Yeah. Okay. Somehow, Satan influenced Peter you know, and, and, and made him genuinely believe something, which leads me to a point. Even if you're saved, you can genuinely believe something and genuinely even sometimes believe that something's from God and be wrong 100%. How, how is that possible? I don't know. But here's how you find out the difference right here. Yeah. Because if Peter had known what Scripture says, he would have known that Jesus was going to die. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But he didn't pay attention to that. Mm 